We tried to make our characters have feet of clay. Now, poor Spider-Man. I mean, okay, he's pretty good at catching bad guys, but he's apt to get an allergy attack while he's fighting. He <laughs> worries about dandruff. He'll have an ingrown toenail, tears his costume. His Aunt May won't let him go out to save the world because he's not wearing his galoshes and it's snowing out. And uh, the funny thing is, I started doing that as a gag and really to keep myself awake, you know. And, and I found that the readers are as crazy as I am. They started enjoying this sort of thing. I love Spyro the Dragon. The colours, the sound design, the music, and yeah, the traversal system. The simplicity Insomniac Games brought to holding the square button to have a satisfying cartoonish sprint propel Spyro towards enemies made the game both accessible for kids as a platformer and visually pleasing all these years later. Maybe it's just nostalgia, but I will defend that original trilogy to the death. Well, maybe Year of the Dragon less so, but Ripto's Rage was a goddamn masterpiece, so when it was announced that the same company behind Spyro was making the Spider-Man game, I was as pumped about it as anybody else. After all, my voice joins the cacophony of white mid-twenties YouTubers who spout off about how Spidey is their favourite superhero and how much they relate to Peter Parker's struggles. Because Spider-Man is my favourite superhero, and I do relate to Peter Parker's troubles. I too struggle with white sticky stuff while battling a many tentacled monster. What? It's been two years since Spider-Man arrived on the PS4 and collectively made a million consoles scream and creak under its weight. And with Miles Morales just around the corner and this terrifying new version of Peter cynically announced by Insomniac, I figured I'd return to the game and critique the good, the bad and the DLC to see if it still holds up and whether or not it deserves a spot in my games of the generation list. We'll be walking through everything here, treat this as more of a commentary than a straight up critique as we'll be exploring parts of the story in almost excruciating detail, so don't say I haven't warned you. Spoilers ahead. What makes a good Spider-Man story? The web swinging? The villains? The quips? Oh yeah, yeah, I was cleaning the chimney. Because some of the worst adaptions of the webhead have had a plethora of these, to the point where you could argue the story's drowned in them. I've seen some bizarre hot takes that we need a Spider-Man who works alone and doesn't get help, or always stays light-hearted no matter what, or is stuck in poverty for some reason. Look, I'd be the first guy to argue that Comrade Spider-Man is clearly a socialist, but no, these are all way too specific. I'd say that a good Spider-Man story often has just three common stamps. Number one, clear duality between Peter Parker and Spider-Man. Number two, by the end of the story, Peter needs to understand a new dimension to with great power comes great responsibility. And number three, an interesting villain which reflects this back. Now, not every Spider-Man story has these three things, in fact, in my favourite Spidey arc, Peter Parker is barely even in the story, but I think it's a solid foundation to build from. See, ultimately, Peter Parker didn't ask for these powers of his. He's not Iron Man or Captain America. They were thrust upon him. And more than any other superhero, except for the Hulk, bless him, people always forget about the Hulk, his powers come at a price. For every success of Spider-Man, there's often a failure for Peter Parker. Sometimes it's easier to think of them as two separate characters, to the point where, a couple of years ago, Pete literally had his wisecracking, crime-fighting self ripped out of him and given sentience. However, despite this duality, despite this inner turmoil of Pete and Spidey, everyone still knows that Spider-Man's crime-fighting is influenced by a tragedy which struck Peter Parker. Uncle Ben's death gave him the mantra of, with great power comes great responsibility. Even if the MCU movies won't acknowledge it explicitly, every Spider-Man story in one way or another harbours this. If we think of the mantra as a great, stoic, thematic tree that the spider always holds to, each new story should add a leaf to that tree, a message related to Uncle Ben's parting lesson. And of course, a villain directly tied to whichever lesson Peter's going to need to chew over is vital to success as well. 
For example, in Spider-Man 2, Pete's feeling lost, his life as Peter Parker is unravelling and he's looking to Otto Octavius as an example of the sort of man he believes he could be if he gave up his powers. A charming, intelligent, successful scientist married to the woman he loves. The next time you're watching a Spider-Man movie, or playing a Spider-Man game even, ask yourself what the main villain's inclusion in the story says about the webhead. If you struggle with the answer, like I do with, say, Electro in Amazing Spider-Man 2, it's likely it's a mediocre Spider-Man tale. Forgive me for the long-winded chat before even getting into the game, but I thought it was important to establish this before assessing if Spider-Man PS4 lives up to our memory all these years later, and we'll be reassessing these rules when looking at Miles Morales. Alright, let's talk about the actual game now, shall we? Prepare yourselves, this is a beast of an analysis. Spider-Man PS4 has a pacing problem. But the first 10 minutes are absolutely marvellous, sorry, in their presentation and setup. The game's opening is visceral and exciting and immediately tells us everything we need to know about this version of our hero. The game fades in with a single, solitary spider, dangling precariously but confidently by a web. Insomniac Spider-Man theme bleeds in from somewhere far away and, of course, Insomniac have gone the brassy route here. The next time you watch a superhero movie or play a superhero game, take a moment to acknowledge how brass is used. You'll often find that some of the most emotionally resonant superhero themes use brass front and centre. Just look at how Hans Zimmer used it in The Dark Knight. This is all because brass, at least in the language of film, is used to emulate war and war heroes. The western vision of tragic brave figures fighting for the good of all stems from our idea of World War II. And you don't need to be a ranting nationalist to feel a connection to this idea of the brave soldier, a superhero. Panning over, the first picture we see is Uncle Ben, the source of Peter's moral code, followed by pictures of MJ, Harry and Aunt May cluttered on a desk with a police scanner lying active between them, a dead plant and a scientific model. If you've seen my Outer Wilds video, you'll know I couldn't tell you what model exactly. The static of the scanner is the first real sound that we hear, highlighting the importance of Spider-Man's duties in Peter's life, but the focus on Peter Parker in these opening moments, rather than Spider-Man, is obvious. The pictures of his friends, the scientist within, the neglected plant, shamefully ignored because Peter's too busy with his superheroing to focus on something as simple as watering a plant. Instead, he's been too busy sketching and designing gadgets for Spider-Man. We see Norman Osborn on the front cover of a magazine promoting Oscorp's importance in this version of New York, and the foam darts lying atop his face shows us that Peter doesn't exactly have time for the mayor. Two savings jars lie empty. The one for a new laptop has some pennies in it, not exactly enough for new tech, I know that feeling, and the one for a vacation is completely barren. Peter does not have time for a break. He's ready to work himself to death if he needs to. His laptop has a cracked screen, the place is a mess, and as Insomniac's heroic tune changes, we pan up away from the world of Peter Parker and into the world of Spider-Man. Newspaper clippings from the Daily Bugle, Scorpion, Rhino and Electro are pinned to Pete's corkboard. This is a Spider-Man in his heyday. He's already battled many of his famous foes, but it's the picture of Fisk which probably captures our immediate attention. He seems to be the one that got away for the webhead. Crusader or Criminal tells us that his famous Man of the People front is probably working for the New York population but Pete has put his picture up with his other villains, so clearly doesn't trust him. Despite the serious state of the apartment, we get a glimpse into Peter's jovial mind in the post-it notes. We only get a brief glimpse at these, but if you pause, there's a wealth of information here. Need new catchphrase, one says. Another is playful with male JJJ a dozen roses from Secret Admirer. Peter's money troubles, however, are front and centre here. Two of these post-it notes are screaming about needing to pay the rent, but before we, the audience, just like Peter, can think about these real human problems for too long, the scanner rings off. Today is the day we are going to take down Fisk. 
We're a minute and 12 seconds in, and the game has already set us up for a boss fight with one of Spidey's heavy hitters. This snaps a snoozing Peter awake, and with a single, minor sentence, Fisk. The song Alive by Warbly Jets kicks in at full gear. Over the distorted sound of an immediate electric guitar, Pete tosses some bread into a toaster he specifically engineered to quickly make his breakfast in case of emergencies. He sniffs the suit, and it reeks. He's been so overcome with his work-life balance that he hasn't even had time to clean the suit. He gears up, grabs his breakfast, and we get our hero shot. The this has to be one of the freshest hero shots we have ever seen of the webhead. It's not Spider-Man punching an enemy in the face or swinging through the city, it's him stretching in the middle of this ramshackle apartment. It's cluttered, there are stains on the walls and the oven. The calendar, just off from centre, reminds us again that he's behind on his rent. Spider-Man's career is going extremely well, look at how badass this pose is, he's ready for anything, but he's framed by the downhill spiral of Peter Parker's life. And just so the moment really hits home as he calibrates his suit, a final notice is posted through his door and the UI organically flashes up, just like it will during gameplay. His mission objective here is to pay his bills. The very fact we're calibrating our suit up shows us that this is a Spidey who has developed his own and relies upon his own gear, gadgets and spider technology. Not only that, but we see the first of many moments in the game where our hero needs to make a choice. Spider-Man or Peter Parker. Pay his bills but let Fisk get away or take down Fisk and face eviction. He takes a couple of steps towards the envelope, and for a split second it looks like he's going to pick it up, but then he turns, and it's clear he was just making room for a running jump out of the window, and he blasts off into the city. I'm not going to spoil exactly what happens later in the story here, but anyone who's played the game knows that this scene with the bills is paralleled at the very end, where the webhead needs to make one large choice, once again between Peter Parker and Spider-Man, except with much greater stakes. As the chorus of Alive kicks in, we see one of those famous swing through the city scenes. Spider-Man doesn't use any animations here, which we, the player, won't be able to make him do ourselves, and nothing solidifies this more than how organically we transition from the cutscene into controlling Spider-Man swinging through the city. And oh, this gets me every time I start up a new playthrough. It's hard not to feel giddy, but let's not get carried away because before we can even start swinging, there's one more thing to acknowledge. The route outside of Pete's window has one more vital piece of scenery for us to notice, and that is the re-elect Osborne sign on the building opposite, stark and blue and clean so that we definitely can't miss it, highlighting that Norman Osborn is currently the mayor of New York. We are two minutes into the game, and we already know where Peter, Aunt May, Spider-Man, and Norman Osborn are in relation to this version of New York. And that it's straight into the web swinging. From the get-go, we're given full control over Spidey, and an uncomplicated straight run to Fisk Tower for us to experiment and explore how the web swinging feels with this version of the webhead. Following a police chopper, this is how the game tutorialises the web swinging to us. As we muscle forth to Wilson Fisk, Spidey calls his contact in the NYPD, Yuri Watanabe, who will be our source of crime-solving info as the story progresses. Spider-Man asks her permission to get involved in the Fisk takedown, showing that he's working with the police and there's clearly an explicit power dynamic between the two. Spidey respects Yuri. He also tells her that he's been waiting eight years to take Fisk down, so we learn immediately that he's been doing this for a while. He also comments that he needs to wrap this up and get to my real job, and purely because of how confidently the opening moments have been presented to us, this piques the player's interest. What career path has this version of Peter followed? Is he working at the Bugle? Something else? It's a mystery to us for now. The first stop is, where else? Times Square for a quick punch-up. 
The game could have taken us anywhere for a quick tutorial, but this is New York City. We're fucking Spider-Man. Starting the game without Spidey in a famous New York landmark keeps New York feeling alive. We see pedestrians race away from the chaos, and here, surrounded by huge screens of advertising fictional products, we enter into a combat tutorial with some of Fisk's goons. And the use of the truck here to show off the importance of webbing enemies to surfaces during battles is a neat, if not subtle, way of highlighting how the majority of our combat encounters are going to play out. Finishing them off, we see an explosion a block away and race over alongside some cop cars, heightening the sense of danger and fluidity to how the city will respond to events during our playtime. We see Yuri undercover, clearly the situation has gotten out of hand, and Spider-Man offers his assistance one more time. She finally gives him permission to go in there and take Fisk down. And again, we see an organic transition from cutscene to gameplay as Spidey grabs an enemy and smashes through the great front window of Fisk Tower into the entrance hall. Now, note how the webhead's animation works here. He grabs the henchman by the scruff of his neck, and rather than splat him through the window, potentially killing him, the game is careful to position him behind Spider-Man while our hero stretches his legs out. The rest of the game goes to painstaking lengths, most of the time, to paint Spidey as a non-lethal superhero. And it's here, again, seven minutes in, that the game firmly establishes this before throwing us into, honestly, one of the best designed areas of the story. There are plenty of levels here, it's wide open so crowd control gets to be the main focus, and fighting alongside the NYPD reinforces this sense of a siege on a supervillain's headquarters. The cops constantly comment that they don't need us here, that they've got the situation under control, that we'll mess everything up, despite the fact it's very, very clear that they don't. They really, really don't. Facing off against a few waves of these goons introduces us to how the base missions will play out later. We have tutorialized on how the focus gauge works, how finishers are a key part of our strategy, and to top it all off, we even get a cheeky call from Aunt May, introducing her nice and early, adorably asking us if we're still on for dinner later tonight, and making us care about her early on so the stakes of the final act are front and centre in our mind. Sneaking into the server room, we even get a hint of how stealth will work later, nabbing one of the goons and webbing him up inside the vent system, and to keep the pace up, we even need to wipe out all of the henchmen before the server empties itself of evidence, and we're rewarded with our first look at Wilson Fisk, presented on a massive screen, contrasting Spidey's small size with Fisk's sprawling reach and massive power throughout the city. Our 10 minute sequence finishes with Spidey using his brain rather than his brawn against Fisk, managing to hack into the Crime Lord server and downloading imperative evidence which will be used to put the big, bald bastard away for good. Whew. In the space of a simple 600 second section of the game, we've learned so much about our player character and the world Insomniac has created. Peter's been Spider-Man for at least 8 years, putting him at about 23. He's older, but he's not necessarily wise, and this is pinpointed again in these first 10 minutes when Fisk highlights that he's still just a child, even after all of these years. Pete's got a lot of growing up to do, and if you've already played the game, you'll know that before all of this is over, he will. Now, I promise we won't be going this in-depth with every scene of the game here, but this is legitimately one of the strongest 10-minute openings of this generation, and I wouldn't want to do it a disservice by skirting over it. I'm also going to make a point of discussing combat, stealth, and traversal separately in their own sections, but for now, let's look at Kingpin. I really appreciate how the game ties Kingpin tonally to the main campaign through the East Asian suits of armour littering his complex, linking him directly to Martin Lee through some interesting foreshadowing. The revelation that some of the cops we've been working with are under Fisk's thumb brings some new context to the beginning of the mission when they were yelling that Spider-Man's gonna ruin everything as well. Writing your memoirs? Don't forget the hyphen between Spider and Man. Ah, someone's been reading Dan Slott's Twitter, haven't they? I adore how done with Spidey shit Fisk is in this scene. As far as boss fights go, he's fine as an introductory boss. Spider-Man PS4, speaking generously, fails to stick the landing on a lot of its boss fights, but as far as Fisk is being used here, it feels appropriate. 
He brings in henchmen to fight alongside him, which is usually indicative of lazy boss design, but Fisk is more of an introduction to the typical meaty grunts we have to face off against in standard combat from this point onwards. Using his charge attack to barrel through his own men never gets old, but this battle also highlights the one-size-fits-all approach to Spidey's rogues gallery. With the exception of, like, Taskmaster, every single boss in the base game follows the same formula. We can't punch them, so we need to throw objects at them or use our gadgets to web them up first. We then zip in for a couple of smacks or maybe a finisher and then dart away again. Rinse and repeat. Some bosses are more fluid with this approach than others, but it's the game's presentation which truly makes its bosses, not the mechanics themselves. In this case, Fighting Fisk also provides our first bombastic QTE experience, so let's just address those now. There are a fair few moments where the game will funnel you into a tunnel of button mashing... goodness? Now look, I understand that there are a few sections where things are happening which would be almost impossible to replicate through pure gameplay, and I'm in the camp where I don't mind quick time events and my high energy action cutscenes, but these need work. And with Miles Morales just around the corner, I hope they feel more organic. It's almost impossible to fail these, and a simple way to fix them would be to strip a lot of the button mashing out and use the analog sticks instead to make your efforts a little more complex. Just look at the work Amazing Lucas did, where he upgraded the QTEs from the crane scene to see how cool this would look instead. Anyway, we defeat Kingbin by basically smashing him through every single floor of a skyscraper and web him up so he lands nice and safe. Non-lethal, baby. Uh... Our prologue ends with some fateful words from Fisk as well. Idiot! I'm the one who kept order in this city! One month! In one month, you wish you had me back! And pff, oh boy, if only we knew how true that would be. Spider-Man is a hero who constantly feels alone, and needs to be reminded that this couldn't be further from the truth. So let's walk through the first quarter of the game and look at how Pete and his pals are portrayed to us. After taking down Fisk, we get to discover where this game's version of Peter is currently working. It's clear Insomniac were really proud of this reveal, to the point where they transparently tried to keep the mystery alive by labelling an incoming call from his boss, Otto Octavius, as simply work at the start of the game. And then from every point on, his alliterative name shows up with glorious clarity. It's not the most intriguing way of keeping a card close to one's chest, but we almost immediately learn who Pete works for a few moments later, so I'm not going to rail on the game too much for this. I'm sorry I'm late. Oh. Now, look, I might be the only person in the world who didn't think for one second that Octavius was going to become the final boss in this game, and I'll wear that badge proudly. All of the marketing materials presented Mr. Negative as the big bad, helped along by the Sinister Six, but I clearly missed a trick here. The way they frame our first look at Otto, he looks like the monster he would later become, dressed in his distinct green colour with the wiring spiralling out of his back like his famous tentacles. Otto, just like Pete, is a guy who is constantly beaten down by the world around him. The Grant directors, Norman Osborn, his physical body, he's Peter's boss, yet Peter is his only friend, and he constantly reminds us of that. When reviewers first harped on about how the game makes you feel like Spider-Man, sections like this were part of what they meant. We play as both Pete and Spidey throughout the game, and whilst Pete's sections are slowed right down, the world is so intriguing and there are plenty of easter eggs scattered throughout that these sections just strengthen the tone rather than take anything away. To feel like Spider-Man is to feel all of the complications and difficulties which Pete faces in and out of the suit. In these slower sections as Pete, it's clear Insomniac felt like they had to break up these story beats with gameplay. So thus, the science puzzles were born. The goddamn science puzzles. 
There are way too many of these in the game, and I know I'm not alone when I say I'd rather have nothing than these dull mini-games for the Peter Parker sections. Like, I understand the idea, Pete's a genius, so we need to showcase that through gameplay, but to go from this to this is jarring to say the least. A visual change wouldn't solve the issue with the plotting design, but the dull grey colour palette makes these sections so visually unappealing that on my second playthrough I almost immediately selected the skip signs puzzles option. Insomniac, if you have to put an option into your game to skip some of the gameplay, maybe that gameplay shouldn't be in your game in the first place. Now, the nature of the beast with a Spider-Man game is that it really probably should be open world. We want to swing about a city, have the ability to stop random crimes. Games like Edge of Time have their place in the Webhead's anthology, but if you have the option between an open world Spider-Man or a level by level Spider-Man, we'd all take the former every single time. So when we're swinging about and Peter mentions, Gotta love Doc's enthusiasm, but sometimes it gets him into trouble. Better get there before he hurts himself. There's a dilemma presented to the player. As far as the story is concerned, this sounds like we should make it our utmost priority, but I'd rather flex my muscles and fight some goons instead, or maybe clear out a Fisk base. And Spider-Man PS4 lets me do that. Otto might very well tell me that he needs me ASAP, but I could spend two, three, four hours fighting henchmen and engaging in side missions. Peter needs to constantly make the hard choices, choose between going to Otto or saving a mugging, but by giving the player that option with zero consequences, it's not a hard choice at all. We can go and see Otto whenever the hell we want. If the game really wanted to make us feel like Spider-Man, it would fade to black after our call with Otto and just zap us over to the next story beat. But that would frustratingly wrench some freedom from the player, and nobody wants that. It's a catch-22, and I'm glad Insomniac sacrificed immersion for freedom in this case. Speaking of things we're going to do instead of fulfilling our responsibilities, let's talk about some of the collectibles. Spider-Man PS4 falls into the Ubisoft camp of having towers to unlock to reveal parts of the map, which in turn reveals side content and collectibles. We have backpacks, landmarks, black cat stakeouts, random crimes, taskmaster challenges, <gasps> research stations, side missions, secret landmarks, and a whole variety of bases for combat challenges. All of the side content is threaded together with silly narrative details that ultimately makes them less boring than they actually would be. I'm not four years old anymore, I'm not incentivized just because gems are pretty colours and they make fun noises. So for example, as we unlock more and more of the towers across the map, we get snippets of dialogue between Yuri and... <sighs> Spider Cop. And you know what? This is silly and I don't mind this stuff at all. I don't understand why my contemporaries on YouTube have it in for these collectathons. As far as optional side content is concerned, I know I'd rather be finding Spider-Man's backpacks across the city than generic Riddler trophies, and whilst finding the backpacks themselves aren't particularly challenging, they're not harmful to the experience you have with the game. They're simple and charming. For every backpack we find, we get a token as part of our upgrade currency, which I will get to, and also a little story related to the Spider-Man comics. Each snippet of information informs the history of this version of Spider-Man. What's he been up to in the eight years he's been in the suit? Well, he battled Kingpin on the night of his prom, he had a close call with Electro when he nearly blinded him, and so on. It adds to the atmosphere of the game, and a lot of these inform much of our understanding of the dynamic between Peter and Mary Jane. We find dumpling recipes and the menu from their first date, which brings their past rushing forward to the present long before we meet her. But for now, Pete's next stop after meeting Otto is the Feast Centre, currently being managed by Aunt May and owned by the mysterious Martin Lee. May is as hardworking as ever, and seeing Feast in a Spider-Man adaption is really quite lovely. Not only does Feast give May something to do, it becomes the central location for a lot of the game's story. May works there, Martin Lee owns it, Miles works there to grieve, Peter ends up living there, and it's where Miles gets his powers, and when everything goes to hell, it evolves into a pandemic centre, and the location of May's final lesson to Peter. 
Copying Feast's origins from the comics is a natural way to introduce Martin Lee to the story. His proximity to Aunt May makes him a more threatening villain than if he was just some guy looking to take down Osborn, and portrays him as a good, charitable, decent man who truly believes in the good work the organisation does. Locked in this internal struggle between his true self and his alter ego makes him a natural reflection for Peter. We'll talk about this in more depth later, but I want you to take note of it for now. Now, as far as MJ is concerned, all we know by this point of the story is that Pete and her have taken an extended... break from each other. But we don't quite know why. Luckily for us, moments after May mentions her, MJ decides to give Pete a call. Looks like she's in hot water. Well, okay then, time to go and save... Look around and familiarize What the hell is this? I'll be... So yes, the MJ missions have been widely criticised, and I'm going to be joining that crowd. They are simply too many Mary Jane Watson missions in the game. I'd argue that a third of these missions are pretty decent, but the rest, and this one included, they suck. This version of Mary Jane works for the Daily Bugle as an investigative reporter, and it's a fresh angle to take, making her immediately relevant to Spider-Man's story, if not making her essentially Lois Lane. It's fantastic that MJ becomes a source of information for our missions, and incorporating her into the likes of the demon bases keeps her relevant and gives her agency in the story, and this comes into conflict with Peter, who naturally just wants to protect her from the perils he faces every day. This is great, I don't have a problem with any of this. The issue is in the mission designs. So MJ has gone undercover at the Fisk Estate sale. She explores displays of the East Asian memorabilia that we noticed back in the opening mission, but it ultimately goes to hell when a new gang, the Demons, storm the place. This mission prior to the Demons arriving is fine. Sneaking around Rose Roseman, great name, acts as a tutorial for MJ's stealth missions, but honestly there's not much to tutorialise. MJ has next to no stealth mechanics until the last... 10% of the game. I'm getting ahead of myself, we'll talk about MJ stuff once we get to Miles Morales. The two go hand in hand. But for now, let me make the bold claim that one of Spider-Man PS4's failings is in how it handles stealth. Pete shows up, kicks some demon ass, and ultimately he and MJ have a very cute scene at their local diner. The relationship between the two is one of the most finely crafted parts of Spider-Man PS4's story. There are numerous points which are so relatable to your average relationship, and picking up their romance post-breakup, rather than focusing on the how-they-got-together portion we often see in Spider-Man stories, and in some cases have to suffer through, keeps a dynamic we've seen 1,000 times much more interesting. And hot damn, Laura Bailey works her ass off in this game to make MJ likeable, so much so that despite the poor stealth missions, she might very well embody my favourite Mary Jane Watson on screen, and I haven't been so invested in a will they, won't they in a long time. And mate, if you didn't awe at the Stan Lee cameo, you're barely human. Love seeing you two together again. You always were my favourites. Ugh, that hurts my heart, but there's no time to think too long about it. Spider-Man happily bathes in the classic superhero trope of emotional moment is interrupted by bad guy. Shocker's tearing up the town, so we head on after him. Now, the reason Spider-Man gets away with interrupting these scenes and another superhero game that I promise I wouldn't talk about doesn't is twofold. See, the game regularly takes a breather so we can check in on our characters and they can discuss the story's events and how it affects them. And the second is the radio conversations. These things are constant. Missions are regularly broken up by characters arguing over the radio, informing us of what they've been up to, flirting, joking, and yes, occasionally spouting some exposition to keep us in the loop. The game never relents from its character writing, even when Spidey's launching himself across the city, hot on Shocker's trail. Chase scenes like these are a staple of many an open-world Spider-Man game. Right back to Spider-Man on PS1, I remember the thrill of chasing Venom across the rooftops, and they're such a fun, engaging part of the character's action scenes, if done right, that I'm heartbroken we only get this once or twice in the base game. And, to add insult to injury, this is very on rails. It doesn't matter how upgraded your Spider-Man is, how many of the web-swinging upgrades you've unlocked, you will always catch Herman Schultz when the game wants you to, rather than organically. 
Anyway, webbing Shocker up, Pete takes the mask he and MJ uncovered at the Fisk exhibit to Martin Lee, who is immediately rattled and unnerved by the fact Pete has it. By the time the game released, we'd all seen the scenes with Mr. Negative, so it's pretty obvious that Martin Lee will soon turn out to be our big bad. Watching Pete hand over the mask to someone who will soon become one of his villains is slightly frustrating, but Spider-Man's always been a scientific genius rather than an emotional one, so seeing the darkness in Lee's heart is hardly a given for him. What immediately follows afterwards is a call from Otto, and we're faced with easily one of my favourite scenes in the game. Octavius has had a radical breakthrough, and the robotic prosthetic he and Pete have been working on is finally ready for their veteran patient. Otto Octavius has been determined to make good for his past mistakes by helping others. The arm is working, everything looks like it's going to be okay. And then suddenly, boom, Norman Osborne arrives. This is a fantastic introduction to Osborne. He's smarmy, charming, feigning that he's trying to help Octavius, but is ultimately abusing his powers as mayor to defund him and Peter. He's smooth, not threatening at all. It's an effortless show of power, clad in the colours of his alter ego, the Green Goblin. This version of Norman doesn't need his costume to be dangerous. Octavius's defeat here is heartbreaking. Up until this point, he's been a beacon of optimism that Pete has looked up to, and all it took was a two-minute scene with Osborne to utterly deflate him. Worst of all, the funding's gone. Pete might have just lost his job. Don't forget that the game opened with a major win for Spider-Man. Wilson Fisk is finally behind bars, Spidey's kicking ass, but Peter Parker is on the ropes. The toing and throwing of the two halves of our hero are beginning to cause some cracks. Luckily-ish, Shocker's broken out of jail and is on the run, again, so the webhead's got an outlet for some of that aggression that'll have been pent up. Now, everyone's favourite D-lister has appeared in almost every single Spider-Man game, so I would have been shocked uh, if we didn't get a proper one-on-one -on -one with this angry boy. I also actually really, really enjoy this boss fight, even if it is a silly one. The wide open space encourages us to swing around rather than remain on the ground. Shocker blasts away at us and we have to keep dodging him whilst throwing debris his Wii to stun him. Does that sound like another boss we fought a few hours earlier? But Shocker shakes things up a bit by having a second stage and <gasps> a third stage? Whoa, Herman, don't put yourself out for our sake. And no quick time events? Stop it, Insomniac, you're spoiling us. Reeling from our Shocker boss fight, Spidey gets a call telling us that he needs to go and help another member of the NYPD, Jefferson Davis. You'll notice a bit of a trend as we further the story. This Peter works with numerous members of New York's finest over the course of the game. Yuri, Jefferson, a small handful of other cops and detectives. Even in the DLC, he works with a greying mustachio detective from the past. Sort of. There's nothing really worth analysing here, I just think it's interesting. Spidey's been going strong for eight years now, it makes sense that the police would start to embrace his existence rather than fight against it. It turns out that he got a tip that the demons were going to ambush a Fisk warehouse. It's smart for Insomniac to pit us alongside Jefferson for a battle against the demons. Investigating the warehouse and uncovering some of Fisk's secrets with him is fun. Ultimately, the reason why we're even here is because Insomniac wanted to endear us to Jefferson, and they succeed. We don't learn anything imperative to the plot in this mission, some throwaway details about Fisk's crime operation and that the demons are invested in it. See, when people say that Spider-Man PS4's main story has a lot of filler, this is what they mean. A lot of the in between missions, you know, the ones that make you go, oh god yeah I forgot that happens as we walk through the game, are there purely for character development, very little else. Spider-Man PS4 throws a lot of balls into the air in its opening hours, a victim of how fleshed out its world feels, and bless them, they try their damnedest to keep juggling them at the risk of harming the pacing. Battling the demons with Jefferson brings a new dimension to combat as well. Having an NPC who can actually do damage against enemies is like a breath of fresh air. Jefferson can fire on and stun enemies for us to finish, and it makes us care about him a lot, despite just being a character from one mission. Why couldn't we get more stuff like this? A mission with Yuri later, perhaps? The closest is working with Black Cat in the DLC and Silver Sable, and we'll talk about them when we get to them. 
Towards the end of the mission, Jefferson saves us in a cutscene, reinforcing him one final time as everybody's absolute fave. Sure hope nothing bad happens to him later. There's quite a bit which happens between Jefferson Davis saving us and the end of Act 1. Our favourite cop is going to be awarded a Medal of Honour for his heroism. Black Cat returns and we unlock her stakeout missions as side content. Pete gets evicted and has to track down his gear in one of the best missions in the game, I'm not kidding. But we'll talk about that in depth in the next section. For now, just know that Pete is officially homeless, and will be for the rest of the game, so he has to hunker down at feast for the rest of our playtime, camping out on Aunt May's couch. Despite a successful stakeout with Jefferson Davis as Spider-Man, Peter has now lost something yet again. For every one of Spider-Man's wins, Pete loses something. This also means that he's living in Martin Lee's territory, right under the thumb of our villain. Speaking of which, it's Act 1 finale time, meaning it's time to talk about Spider-Man's combat. Jefferson Davis is busy preparing for his award ceremony, but he asks the webhead to do him a favour and investigate a nearby Fisk construction site as he got a tip off the demons are converging there. We swing on over, fight some goons, and relive the infamous 2017 E3 demo, this time with less puddles. This battle is indicative of combat in the rest of the game. First things first, meet the Triangle Button, your new god. Worship it, praise it, it will dictate the flow and tide of each of Spider-Man's fights, so the two of you better get acquainted and fast. As a hero, Spidey is both a crowd control combatant as well as a reactive fighter, meaning you need to be aware, particularly in this iteration, where enemies are and what they're doing at all times. Encounters in Spider-Man PS4 throw waves of enemies at you, to the point where later battles with the tougher Sable enemies can start to feel overwhelming. Brian Intihar, the game's creative director, stated that as far as game feel was concerned, Insomniac wanted players to feel improvisational during combat, pulling from a vast array of options. As Spider-Man, you have a standard melee attack, web attack, environmental attacks, and of course, the massive allotment of gadgets. But as we've discussed on this channel previously, not all options are created equal, and the key to good combat design, especially in a beat-em-up like this one, is how the player is forced into using these options. Despite having a variety of factions, the enemy types are all, at a core level, very similar. A brute who works for Kingpin, for example, isn't that mechanically different from a brute that works for the demons. All in all, the main campaign has nine enemy types. Standard grunts, gunmen, rocket launchers, shield enemies, stumbaton enemies, brutes, jetpack enemies, whip enemies, and tombstones pals who can make themselves momentarily invulnerable. This may sound like a small number, and it is, variety is the spice of life after all, but each enemy requires a specific strategy to take them down. For example, you can't just button mash a shield enemy or a stumbaton enemy. These henchmen require you to use environmental objects or pull a weapon out of their grasp. It's inevitable that comparisons will be made to Batman Arkham's combat, but honestly, every time I hear Spider-Man and Batman discuss side by side, my insides dry up and crust like an overcooked pizza. So let's do that. Batman's combat has a very particular rhythm to it. He flies across each arena like a heat-seeking missile with no input from the player once an enemy is taken down. It looks great, it feels badass, but challenging combat it is not. With Spider-Man, we have to keep being aware of enemy positions and, using that triangle button, the webhead manually zips to whichever enemy the player is targeting. This won't happen without us thinking about it. In the Arkham games, the sound design and animation embodies a rigidness to the combat, like it's written in a 4-4 time signature. And that's great, I, I love the Arkham games, the combat is very satisfying as a result of this rhythm. Square, triangle, square, square, triangle. But Spider-Man doesn't have the same rhythm, not even close. In my Cuphead video, I discussed how that gameplay embodies jazz to reinforce motifs in the soundtrack. If Cuphead's combat is influenced by jazz, Spider-Man's is influenced by swing. Oh my god, that's another pun. Uh, it's, it's too late now, and I'm not changing it. There is an energetic sense of randomness and improvisation to Spider-Man's combat because of how each enemy requires a specific strategy to take them down. At first, triangle, X, trigger buttons, triangle, square, 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 square. 
because once the player unlocks the ability to wrench weapons and shields away from an enemy, a lot of our previous strategies vanish. Now instead we just hold down the triangle button, rip a gun, shield, stun baton, or rocket launcher away from an enemy, and basically demote this enemy from being a little tricky and different to just being a standard grunt. It's part of our initial decision making that we can either use our speed, agility, and gadgets against an enemy, or rip a weapon out of their grips and make them piecemeal for our spider strength. As far as the counter system is concerned, Spider-Man's Spidey Sense will reliably let us know if an attack is incoming, but Spidey can't counter like Batman can, so again any comparisons claiming that Insomniac just ripped off the Arkham combat are, at best, shallow analysis. Not only this, but the dodge windows, whilst generous, have an intrinsic layer of skill to them if we want to make the most of a dodge. The perfect dodge mechanic means that if we time our dodge just right, we can momentarily stun an enemy with a projectile whilst we dodge out of the way. Hell, in the late game, you can even open up an armed enemy to an instant takedown if you perfect dodge, meaning the player is incentivized into timing their dodges just right. It's not a necessary option, but it's one which will make the player's life much easier. Now, apparently one of the strengths Insomniac used when they pitched Sony for the Spider-Man IP was their history with gadgets. You just need to look at Ratchet and Clank to see that, yeah, they certainly had a leg on to stand here. And with Peter Parker being the big old nerd that he is, of course gadgets could factor into his combat style. But some of these gadgets are ultimately useless in the long run. See, with a battle you have one very reliable takedown method. Webbing enemies to surfaces. It's the reason why we had to battle some grunts alongside a large lorry in the opening 10 minutes. This is one of the best ways for Spider-Man to take down his foes. Trip mines, impact webs, and web bombs are your three best friends, and if you need a breather, sure, the electro web is also pretty useful. If I'm getting along just fine with these four gadgets, why in the hell do I need the concussion blast or the suspension matrix? Best case scenario, I might just toss this down, throw some enemies into the air, and then web them up while they're suspended. But, but Insomniac, I can do that already without the suspension matrix, look. Problem solved, why would I add an unnecessary step in my web takedown strategy? Speaking of webs, one really nice touch is how the game goes to painstaking lengths as we mentioned earlier to make Spider-Man's animations non-lethal. Kicking an enemy off of a rooftop leads to an automatic thwip of Spidey's wrist so the enemy is webbed to the side of a building rather than lying dead on the ground. Taskmaster even gives an in-universe excuse for Spidey's super strength not breaking necks when we punch an enemy in the face. Although, um, I'm not sure swinging an exploding motorcycle into a bad guy's face is necessarily non-lethal. Uh, wait, uh, how is he getting up from that? Spider-Man's combat has plenty of strategy and does require the player to, using Insomniac's words here, improvise. But there's a lot which could be improved upon in the next game. It's not a bad combat design by any stretch of the imagination, in fact it's pretty riveting and satisfying in my book, but yeah, more inventiveness could go a long way here. Despite being a crowd control hero, I have a real problem with Spider-Man's lack of AoE attacks. Some major upgrades are needed because currently swinging something around to knock enemies down just isn't enough, and often our attacks will be focused on one enemy at a time, despite clearly kicking through other enemies. Anyway, we've discussed the combat at length, and in that time, Spidey has chased and ridden a helicopter across the city. It's no wonder this was the section Insomniac continued to use to demo the game, as it's fast-paced, action-packed, and shows an agile side to Spider-Man's adventure. As far as our hero is concerned here, the threat of the demons has been neutralised, capitalising on his cockiness from the earlier scene with MJ when he waved this gang away as barely a threat. The next mission is about to change all of that. At Osborne's campaign rally, Jefferson Davis steps up to receive his award, and in slow motion, we witness what can only be described as a terrorist attack. Oh, this is one of the strongest parts of the game. The framing of Rio over Miles and MJ over Peter hints at the parallel path our two Spider-Men will soon find themselves on. Jefferson Davis is our first, count it, first death in the game. Up until now, our story has been very PG with webs and goons and quips, but no corpses. Act 1 of the game ends with a lot of death. 
Spider-Man is out of the fight, so we're placed in the shoes of Miles, numbly stumbling through the chaos in search of his father, the world literally crashing down around him as his familial life does the same. Depowering us and forcing us to play as Miles keeps the seriousness of this scene as well. There's no excitement here, no flips, no kicks, none of Spider-Man's jokes. It's perfectly framed to retain this deathly macabre tone, and imagery is seen Norman Osborn's big, dumb, grinning face and pompous, capitalised name hints that he's the source of all of this. If he hadn't experimented on Martin Lee as a child, an attack like this never would have happened in the first place. As Miles comes to find his father, the section ends with Martin Lee revealing himself as the mastermind of the attack. Spider-Man's cockiness got the better of him. The demons are a real threat, and the fight isn't over. All of this ends with Peter, Miles, MJ, Rio, and Aunt May standing by a graveside, mourning the loss of a character who the game effectively built up as sympathetic and likeable. The visible fear on Jefferson's face when he has to step up to make a speech is adorable. He helped us out in a fight against the demons. He gave us our electric webs for God's sake. The weight of this loss is perfectly handled. Making Miles a core part of this world, tying his story directly to Peter's, eases us into the idea that one day we might be playing as him. Hell, the reaction when Spider-Man Miles Morales dropped a trailer for us was one of the highlights of Sony's PlayStation 5 reveal. People are excited about Miles, and it's because of how he and his family are introduced here. I know what you're going through. Uh, that's what you were going to say, right? Or it all gets easier with time. Or don't worry. It's, it's a part of God's plan. I'm sorry. I was just try trying to help. I know. Act 2 opens with the news that Norman Osborn has hired Sable International, a fascistic militia group, to disperse some protesters from a nearby church so he can have a photo opportunity. No, Wh no it's not. What's that? No, you're thinking of Donald Trump. Oh, whoops, sorry, I, I got my fascists mix up. Uh, Sable's here to investigate and clamp down on demon activity across the city. In keeping with the game's greatest strength, the presentation of its world, it's really fun how we can learn he's bringing in Silver Sable if you listen to J. Jonah Jameson's radio show before she even shows up. Actually, while Spidey investigates the demons and learns that they are targeting Norman Osborn directly, let's talk about the world building. A wise YouTuber once said that if gameplay is king, then story is queen, and if both of those are true, then atmosphere is a jack. Spider-Man PS4's atmosphere is above and beyond what everyone initially expected, and whether you realise it or not, it's certainly one of the reasons why the game received such great reviews. Insomniac really didn't hold back with trying to make New York City feel alive here. This isn't just a sandbox with some skyscrapers for us to fight goons in, there are some great details which give Manhattan a sense of depth and movement that we haven't seen in a Spider-Man game before. NPCs play basketball, give Spider-Man high fives, comment on a new suit as we swing through the streets, and considering the player isn't exactly going to spend hours jogging around the city, it certainly feels like Insomniac wants you to. When the game enters into its third and final act, the city evolves as well. Feast turns into a pandemic centre, shanty towns appear across parks and greenery, the sidewalks end up being littered with trash and bin bags, where once we loved swinging through the goldenly lit city that never sleeps, by the end of the game it can feel like a dystopian nightmare ready to eat you up. The side missions, and even some of the story missions, fill the city with people rather than blank NPCs. We even get access to a fictional Twitter to track what individuals think about the wall crawler's antics as the story progresses. Even the fast travel loading screens bring dimension and character to New York. People sleep on Spidey's shoulder in the subway, pizza places and restaurants are constantly referenced and recommended. Quest givers have character and personality. I'm immediately reminded of being assisted by a dorky bird watcher who spotted some hooligans up to no good in Central Park. Or the imposter Spider-Man mission where some goofball in a suit just like ours is preventing muggings and we have to help him face off a gang of thugs that he's not ready for. And yes, J. Jonah Jameson's radio show is half of the reason I enjoyed swinging about so much including the DLC, there is an hour and a half's worth of just the facts with J. Jonah Jameson, and each one is funny and one of the best versions of this character we have ever seen. New Yorkers call in to agree with him or tell him he's a jackass. I mean, one of my favourites by far is when... 
Well, I'll just play the clip for you. You might have heard about the robbery at Roseman's auction house. What you probably didn't hear, but my sources confirm, is that the perpetrators were wearing masks. Horrible, demonic faces. Yet another example of the explosion in mass criminals since Spider-Man came on the scene. Let's hear your thoughts. You're on with J. Jonah Jameson. Yeah, I see your point, but Spider-Man stopped those guys today. Saying he's like them because he wears a mask isn't fair. It's like prejudice. Wrong. Here's a little lesson in the English language, my friend. Prejudice means to prejudge someone before you know anything about them. I know all I need to about Spider-Man. He runs around causing chaos, wearing a mask so he doesn't have to answer for his shenanigans, and a flashy costume so he gets attention to feed his gigantic, insatiable ego. Now, if I'm a mentally unstable person, and I see him getting all this coverage, what am I going to do? It's called copycat behavior, people, and it's ruining New York. I appreciate that Insomniac gives you the option of unsubscribing from Jonah, but like, who would? Evolving Jonah to an Alex Jones-esque conspiracy talk show host feels like a natural next step for the character, though comparing Jonah to Alex Jones is doing the guy a disservice. At least JJJ has some good qualities. I openly awed when I heard him unironically state that New Yorkers in the final act of the game need to stick together, look out for one another, with zero punchline during the Devil's Breath pandemic. I haven't seen Alex Jones say anything like that. To rewind our story back an hour, let's look at, in my opinion, one of the most underrated missions in the game, Home Sweet Home. One of the greatest things about the Sam Raimi Spider-Man movies is how involved in the city Peter was in those films. The New Yorker montages are one of the best parts of the trilogy. From grabbing a drink at a bar or guest delivering pizzas, it felt like he had a finger on the pulse of Manhattan. In Home Sweet Home, the game puts this front and centre. Pete gets evicted from his apartment and has to go on a journey across the city to find his stuff. He has to work directly with Eddie in sanitation and keeps calling him up to pester him while he basically roots through New York's garbage. The two of them use reference points like pizza joints that have been replaced by different pizza joints with the same name, using New York landmarks to guide Spidey through the city. Basically a bin man helps Spider-Man out rather than the other way around. It's a real breath of fresh air as far as pacing and variety is concerned. So all of this is at the front of our minds when Silver Sable appears and locks horns with us. The Sable checkpoints that suddenly erupt around the city are a damn eyesore, meaning we want nothing more than to tear them down and rid New York of Sable International. In an effort to help him grieve, Pete gets Miles a job working at Feast. A project to focus on will do him some good, like it did Pete when Uncle Ben died. And once May agrees to take Miles on, absolute gem that she is, we investigate Lee's villain room. What we learn here is that Lee has an obsession with Norman Osborn and that he's after something called the Devil's Breath. We also learn that Martin Lee has no interest in harming Aunt May, presenting the dichotomy of our villain to us pretty plainly. Mr. Negative has two sides to him, just like Peter does, and he's wrapped up in an internal struggle, just like Peter is. But it doesn't mean he'll suffer fools gladly. Peter was there. He was very lucky. At an Osborne rally. I didn't know you were a fan. Well, what matters is you are both safe. Amen. But the bombers are still out there. Who knows what they've planned next? I don't think you or May have anything to worry about, as long as you stay away from places you're not supposed to be. This is about the time when Harry Osborne's research stations are unlocked for us to explore as part of some of the side content. These are… fine, to be honest. The actual challenges themselves are interesting because they require us to use our web swinging to solve each problem, but they certainly feel like the slowest of the side content. In order to activate each one, we have to walk inside the research station, watch the same footage of a panning shot of some skyscrapers, and listen to what could ultimately be some copy-pasted dialogue from Harry about how his mum's dead, and this research lab was important to her as all the others, and Oscorp's gonna shut it down, so... Uh, anyway, the, the excuses for these existing are flimsy at best. I understand that Insomniac wanted to keep Harry relevant, but honestly I could take them or leave them, even if the final research lab mission is absolutely fucking fantastic. 
See, once you reach the final research lab mission, you have to swing a full loop of the city, connecting satellites while using your speed, mobility, and web swinging abilities to dodge imminent strikes of lightning through a thunderstorm. There's a real challenge here. Often you have to change direction swiftly if Spidey's spider sense goes off because the lightning strikes quickly, and the mission ends with us reaching the very top of Oscorp Tower, trying to make the lightning strike the antenna. Using the side content to guide us to the location where we'll eventually fight Dr. Octopus in a few hours makes the final clash quite invigorating. It also ends with Spidey commenting that Harry hasn't been answering calls, texts, or anything while he's away in quote-unquote Europe, but he doesn't seem to give a webbed shite. Why doesn't this bother him? Speaking of the research stations and traversal challenges, let's talk about the web swinging. The research stations aren't the only side content focused on slinging ourselves across the cityscape. We also have to catch pigeons. I have very little to say about these, they are absolutely harmless. I'm glad they're there because I love a good chase mission, but they fall into the same camp as every other chase mission. It all feels very on rails, like you can't catch the pigeon until the game is ready for you to. A decent web swinging mechanic is key to a good Spider-Man game. It's the reason Spider-Man 2 is still so lauded all of these years later despite those systems seeing archaic in hindsight. There is a lot that this system gets very, very right. It's accessible for a start. Insomniac were determined to keep Spider-Man moving across the city, so with our chubby fingers firmly jammed in the R2 button, the plan is that Spider-Man will travel over rooftops no matter what. Rather than slamming into a wall, he'll just run right up it. If we skim along the side of a skyscraper, he'll sprint along the side before leaping off into another thwip. With a simple tap of the X button, he'll leap into the next swing. This will carry us through the majority of the game. Some visually impressive, yet easy to execute options pop up as this game progresses. For example, with the L2 and R2 button, we can cinematically dash to surfaces through water tanks and cranes, but realistically you have to go out of your way to find these. More complex options would be very welcome. Pressing X mid-air will zip us a little bit further, and if we time our release during swings, we can trade height for momentum, and vice versa. Like I said, it's accessible. The swinging feels satisfying, but the primary reason that it feels that way is because of your DualShock 4, not because of the mechanics themselves. Yeah, you heard me right. Unfortunately I can't display that to you in this video, but the next time you pick up the game, pay real attention to your undervalued vibration system in your controller. The little buzzes triggered by your swinging and release do give a cohesive sense of having the web shooters papping out some of the white stuff. If all of a sudden somebody turned off the vibration function in your controller, you would lose some of that satisfaction. Look, I know, I love swinging about in this game doing sweet FA as much as the next guy, and swinging is fun, but this is a 30 hour game, and by hour 15, you start noticing some kinks in the traversal system. Take the parkour for example. There are distinct moments where Spidey needs to leap over and through some debris, and these boil down to the R2 button. Look at the footage on screen. Look at the sweet leaps and spins that the webhead's doing. I'm not doing that. Spider-Man is. I'm just holding down the trigger button, leaving a distinct disconnect to Pete's movement and the action the player is taking. Same goes for wall crawling. It's nigh impossible for you to stand at a ledge and start climbing up a wall. In fact, scaling walls has to be the most confounding system in the game. The tutorial tries to teach you to use the trigger buttons to flip over to a wall by simply aiming and shooting yourself at it, but you can only do this when the game allows you to. And the game doesn't always let you. Presumably because Spider-Man's so far away using the same aiming system as shooting gadgets. The distance on these needs to be increased. At the risk of sounding hyperbolic, it's fucking inexcusable for the wall zip to use the same aim distance as the web shooters. We get XP for specific traversal as well. For example, using the point launch system 500 times awards 50 XP. 50 XP. You heard that right. Let me say it one more time. 50, 50 XP. For context, completing a simple campaign objective like speaking to Doc Ock awards at least a thousand XP. Tricks award like 2 XP per trick, and we need to unlock this in the skill tree rather than it being achievable from the beginning. The rewards here for creatively exploring traversal options are so minimal that there's not much of an incentive to play with these systems. As far as recommendations go, giving the traversal system its own currency like backpack tokens or crime tokens in future games would increase our determination as a player to engage with the traversal, rather than passively use R2 and X just to swing about the city. Speaking of Doc Ock, he's got something for us to see, so let's swing by the lab to check in on him. You ready? <laughs> uh. 
Everything okay? Damn it! So AIM has started to fund Octavius's work, so Pete's got a job again. Hooray! It is intriguing that AIM was introduced into Insomniac Spider-Verse considering the role they play in Marvel's Avengers, and come to think of it, Pete does comment that the Avengers are currently on the west coast in 2018, so are, are the two games connected? Actually, wait one sec, let me check. No, oh thank god. I think we can all agree that the last thing any of us want is for Crystal Dynamics to get their hands on Insomniac Spider-Man. Phew. It's revealed that Osborne and Octavius went to college and have formed Oscorp together, giving Otto some solid motivation for his fill and turn later. Having Norman Osborne be the catalyst for both Mr. Negative and Dr. Octopus's nefarious deeds has been widely criticised, but honestly, I really, really like this. When you look at Spider-Man PS4 as a whole package, it's clear that Octavius was always Insomniac's goal. Mr. Negative was a red herring for us to focus on, and we'll get to why that is so clever later, but for now, connecting Martin Lee, Otto Octavius, and Norman Osborn makes the story feel like a cohesive whole, rather than the final third of the game being tacked on to a Mr. Negative story. I'm just planting that seed and letting it sit. For now, we've got a date and some side missions to tackle. Pacing-wise, the next mission falls into a widespread issue with Spider-Man PS4. It squeezes the player into playing side content as part of the main campaign. Our first meeting with Taskmaster is a main mission, same with the research stations, the Black Cat stakeouts, and so on. Pete's adorable date night with MJ is lovingly foreshadowed in the backpack collectibles, we find dumpling recipes and so on, again strengthening our understanding of where the relationship was and where it now is. Here, our golden boy is cooking dinner for MJ while she fills him in on what she's been up to. Turns out, she's been sneaking around Tombstone's headquarters. What a rascal! Again, I'm not ready to talk about the MJ and Miles missions yet, don't worry, we'll get there, I promise. But as I mentioned, this whole mission is indicative of Spider-Man's pacing problem. We've just witnessed a terrorist attack. Mr. Negative is out there. We don't care about what MJ has been up to with her day. I understand that Insomniac are trying to naturally introduce their most substantial side mission into the main narrative by bringing it up as a story during date night, but this is unnecessary. We don't need MJ to be involved in the Tombstone subplot. We can tackle him in our own time. His story can arguably even wait until the end game as a little bonus for the player to engage with. And to elaborate on my point earlier, this is a catch-22 with an open-world Spider-Man game. By its very nature, there should be side missions and collectibles for us to web up as we battle through the main story. It's a necessary evil that the pacing of the story will be impacted by the open-world structure in place. This is the best video game Spider-Man story we've ever gotten. Hell, it's one of the best Spider-Man adaptations we've ever gotten despite the pacing issues, but I'd be amiss if I didn't comment on it here, and this MJ mission captures a lot of those issues. Flash to the present, and MJ suggests her and Peter team up, but the chat is interrupted by a residential break-in. It seems some rich guy, Charles Standish, is being raided by the demons. You don't think this has anything to do with Lee, do you? Sorry to cook and run. Did, did you just leave your clothes on the kitchen floor? Uh... Standish has been taken hostage in his apartment. The demons are wanting financial records of Oscorp scientists. It seems they're trying to track down one particular nerd, Dr. Isaac Delaney. There's some fun level variety here. I particularly enjoy the section where we need to run up elevator shafts, dodging firebombs, teaching us how to master a section like this before it's repeated in the raft as we chase Electro. After kicking some ass and taking some names, we save Standish and swing off to find Isaac Delaney, who luckily for the level designers, works at the nearby university. Oh, and it's Halloween. Oh, look, this mission is just an excuse to have a set piece full of Easter eggs, but a superhero game without a costume party is not a superhero game worth playing. We have to take down professors dressed as three of our old enemies, Mysterio, Lizard and Vulture. Personal take, but I especially love the Mysterio moment in the funhouse. It's a cute reference, but hot damn, if we don't see Mysterio in either Miles Morales or Spider-Man 2, I'm gonna snap a disc. The seed has now been planted that Spidey has battled both Mysterio and the Lizard in his past, so they could easily re-emerge in Spider-Man 2. 
The game introduces an excellent hallucinatory sequence later with Scorpion, and it would be all too easy to replicate a sequence like this with Mysterio in a future story. Making it into the university, Spider-Man sees Mr. Negative for the first time, and how his powers can corrupt people. He brainwashes Isaac Delaney into telling him the location of a scientist called Dr. Michael, and this was the moment I realised that, whilst the set pieces of the university or a penthouse vice were certainly unique and interesting, much of our playtime for the past two hours have just been some wild goose chase as Spider-Man runs to rescue three scientists. It feels like padding, but again, because the game is juggling so many balls, it doesn't need padding. The story is almost overpacked, like a Greg's steak bake, and some of the gravy is beginning to fall out. Once Delaney has revealed the location of Dr. Michaels, Lee uses his abilities to force the scientist into shooting himself. If the terrorist attack at the end of Act 1 hadn't set Lee up enough as a distinct threat, witnessing the grotesque way he just murders someone in cold blood certainly solidifies this. Before we can truly stop Lee, he infects the partying students with his corruption, and this highlights a, a real missed opportunity with the combat, because Spidey openly quips that he needs to take down the corrupted students safely without really hurting them, but as far as gameplay is concerned, all this does is make the students easier to fight. As an enemy type, they reappear a few times over the course of the game, but we don't need to do anything special to take them down, for example by just using our gadgets or webs to neutralise them as efficiently and painlessly as possible. Instead, as Spider-Man, we just punch them. The game waves this away with Taskmaster, telling us that Pete pulls his punches. Speaking of which, let's talk about the old skull face and his side missions now, seeing as it's after the university mission that he appears to taunt us. The Taskmaster challenges are excellent, an example of side content done right. There are four varieties, bombs, drones, combat and stealth, and using these smaller targets to influence our reward was a smart play by Insomniac for both these, the active crimes, and the base missions. I didn't think I'd ever say this, but including an insta-fail in the Taskmaster stealth challenges was a welcome change to the lackluster inclusion of stealth in standard missions. The drone challenges let me scratch that Spidey Chase mission itch as well, however, sometimes it was a little bit vague on how you're allocated points. What does webbing mean in the bomb challenges? How do I improve my score there? Ultimately rewarding us with a boss fight for completing all of the challenges increases our incentive to complete them all as well, and teasing us with a quick one-on-one -on -one before the challenges unlock plants the seed that perhaps we'll get to tackle this cocky git if we beat his tasks. The immersive way that we're interrupted while just swinging around by Taskmaster grabbing us and pulling us over to a rooftop made me wish Insomniac had taken a leaf out of Arkham Knight's book with how random events would appear. I think we all remember that man-bat moment whilst climbing over a ledge, and a couple more of these would have strengthened the sense of busyness about the city and the side missions. In direct contrast to Taskmaster, we have the Black Cat Stakeout missions. These are not engaging, falling into the half of missions which, like the research stations, slow you right down. Spider-Man is a momentum hero, so swinging to a rooftop, listening to Felicia flirt with us via voicemail for 10 seconds, and then looking through a camera is… dull to say the least. To top it all off, the reward for this is a new suit, which is a little bland and doesn't have a suit power tied to it, and some sequel bait. We'll get back to this when we jump into the DLC. And despite getting off to a rocky start with a forced MJ mission, the Tombstone side content seems to be a, a cut above the rest, considering it has fully voiced, well shot cutscenes and a legitimate boss fight set in its own arena rather than Taskmaster's random rooftop battle. We also get a new enemy faction in the form of Tombstone's gang. The implementation of these thugs being able to take a drug to make themselves momentarily invulnerable doesn't exactly make them unique as far as enemy types go, but it certainly gives us pause for thought. As far as Tombstone's battle is concerned, it's a fun reward for following the side story, and the way he's presented as this huge, imposing, indestructible shadow at the start of his tale hypes us up for a monstrous encounter, but much like with Kingpin or Shocker before him, Tombstone falls into the camp of an enemy we can't punch until we've used a gadget or chucked an environmental object at him. I know I keep harping on about this, and for some of you, you may not mind it, but it's like Boris Johnson's tiny, tiny eyes. Once you notice it, you can't stop seeing that each boss fight falls into this trap. 
And again, on the other side of the spectrum, we have the Screwball side mission. Everyone's favourite Spider-Man villain is here in full force, and fun fact, during the Superior Spider-Man run, the webhead literally breaks every bone in Screwball's body. Fun! Racing across the city because she's apparently taken someone hostage and is live-streaming our response. And if you hate her characterization, have I introduced you to literally every big Twitch streamer? Or you have hours of time to watch me, and not five dollars. I don't know, what are you doing with your life where you have hours of time to watch Twitch, and not five dollars to provide for the content that you're watching? The greatest letdown of what, ultimately, should be a fun mission is we don't get a boss fight with her in the main game. Like, I'm not expecting much here, Insomniac, but even throwing her in as part of some thugs to fight would have been better than nothing at all. Oh, she's so irritating that all we want to do is punch her in the face, and you hold that chance back just to sell it off in the DLC? Donkey already made the joke, but when Spider-Man breaks into Oscorp Tower, we learn that Osborne is in bed with Fisk, and yes, through a PowerPoint presentation, it's revealed to us what Devil's Breath actually is. It could be the cure to many diseases, but in its current form, it's a bioweapon. Dr. Michaels has it on his person at all times, which explains why Negative wants to find him. We're still locked in this weird hunt for the right scientist. And this is analogous of some real stumbles and falls with the game's exposition, and it's probably one of the laziest things about Insomniac storytelling. I don't just mean the PowerPoint either. At three separate points in the game, we find a villain room, I'd hesitate to call them layers, where Pete just wanders about, examines some objects, and we essentially get our villain's motivation laid out to us through some gear lying on a table. We don't have long to mull over this new discovery of the Devil's Breath though, as we've got a quick call from Doc Ock coming up. He's finally designed the famous appendages, but his success is short-lived as he needs help to take the headset off. Otto, the neural web isn't isolating your motor neurons. It could be affecting other parts of your brain, your, your inhibitions, your mood. I, I just think we need some more tests. We've got enough tests! For the first time in my life, I don't feel like a failure. God, in giving Octavius a neurological disorder, his body slowly breaking down over time, Insomniac have pulled from the best rendition of Dr. Octopus in the comics. I've referenced him already, but for those of you who don't know, a few years ago Dan Slott diagnosed Octavius with terminal cancer, leading to his most nefarious crime yet. Yes, even more nefarious than marrying Aunt May. He swapped bodies with Peter Parker meaning Pete died cold and alone in the body of Doc Ock, whilst Octavius himself leaped into a fantastic run of comics known as The Superior Spider-Man. Honestly, I've written about 2,000 words worth of notes on why this comics run is so fantastic, and whilst it's not video game related, I might just make a separate video talking about why Octavius is my favourite Spidey. But for now, the fact that Insomniac's Peter Parker directly assists in creating one of his most interesting villains is a clever way to work Ock's evolution into this game. Bonding the player with Peter through forcing us to complete a couple of science puzzles really makes us empathise with him later, when our scientific assistance causes Ock to be such a powerful threat. Whilst I despise, truly I do despise them, the science minigames as much as the next guy, this moment of fixing Ock's headset almost makes them all worthwhile. Almost. Once we leave Octavius, the game throws us once more into one of its downtime sections. These pop up about six or seven times over the course of the campaign. Pete makes a roundabout comment on how he's ignoring the city or needs to fight some muggers to clear his head, so let's talk about the muggers. Let's talk about the active crimes. Here's a riddle for you. You are Spider-Man, swinging about the city. The police radio in that there's a disturbance happening in, say, Harlem. You swing over and find some bad guys. You beat them up. Is this crime A. A mugging B. A drug deal C. Assault or D. Police under fire If you guessed any of those answers, you are wrong. It's actually armed robbery, stupid, because when you rip away the differently skinned enemies, there are actually only three different types of crimes in the game. Fighting a group of bad guys, stopping a speeding car, or bomb disposal. 
And look, I don't care what anybody says, the active crimes in Spider-Man PS4 lack any of the creativity we've seen so far in this game. No burning buildings, no Z-list villains to chase down, and honestly sometimes what the game tells you is an active crime isn't really an active crime. Some burly men just chilling on a rooftop, well apparently that's a crime, but we have no evidence that they've done anything. I know this is a nitpick, but it was hard not to start questioning the validity of some of these muggings, quote unquote, we were stopping on top of a skyscraper. Often you can just sit and watch the crimes as well, and nothing will happen without your intervention. Nothing will happen here, the NYPD are absolutely useless. They can't even thin the numbers of criminals without Spider-Man's direct help. And the game even tries to keep up this facade that it contains numerous different types of crimes by segmenting them in your menu as demon crimes or sable crimes, but aside from the types of enemies you fight, they often just boil down to land in the street, fight a wave of bad guys, and swing away while a tiny bit of XP pops into your bar. Speaking of which, it seems that even the most basic thugs scale with your levelling up. I would argue that Spider-Man, with his super strength, should be able to take down a standard grunt in 4 or maximum 5 punches by the time you cap at level 50, but whether you're at the start of the game or swinging around in the end game, Spider-Man never feels that much stronger, despite the game telling us that we've had plus 10 added to our strength. However, the currency system is pretty great. By completing side content, bases, crimes, backpack, photos or research stations, we get a corresponding token. Combining these tokens allows you to create suits, upgrade your gear, or even design new mods which could help in combat. Some of these mods are extremely useful, like increasing a chance to shock an enemy if they get a hit in, and some of them, not so much. Like the long range scanner, which is supposed to be used for stealth missions, but you will never, ever need this. The same goes for suits. Spider-Man PS4 isn't stingy with its unlockables, and most of these aren't purely cosmetic either. Each new suit has a power attached to it. For example, the Noir suit, naturally, gives you the ability to prevent enemies calling for backup. Or the Iron Spider suit, bringing out four metallic arms, which A, changes the animation style of attacks, and B, doubles your strength. And as fun as it is to play around with these different suit types, often you'll find yourself reverting back to the first suit power you get. The Web Blossom, which quickly eliminates all of the enemies in your close vicinity. And again, because the triangle button is your new god, any remaining bad guys can just be webbed to cars and walls. As fantastic as this look, it's a little bit overpowered. And whilst almost all of the suits look fantastic, seriously, some of the attention to detail here is awe-inspiring, some suits are definitely better than others. The Fear Itself suit looks weirdly bulbous and bloated, and what is it about white suits in this game having this strange sheen to them that looks almost blinding? Ultimately, the coolest costume in the game is the one Doc Ock designs for us at the start of the story. The sleek, white spider suit really makes it feel like Insomniac are staying true to Peter Parker's standard look, while putting their own iconic, recognisable spin on it. And to give credit where it's due, remember the hype that built up around the reveal of the Sam Raimi suit? Not only did Insomniac release it for free, but we also got Night Monkey and the new Far From Home costume as well, just for the hell of it. Far From Home came out a year after Spider-Man PS4 did. Insomniac didn't need to revisit the game and bring in a couple of new suits, but they did anyway, for free, asking nothing new of the player. That's pretty fucking badass. Anyway, once we've solved a couple of active crimes, Spidey comes across Miles getting mugged and saves him. Sharing a bonding moment, Pete teaches Miles one of the most important tactics he'll use as the latest Spider-Man. If the other guy's bigger, you gotta be quicker. Alright, put him up. Seriously, yeah, come on. First thing, don't let the adrenaline get to you. Breathe slow, breathe deep, relax. Hip square to your opponent, let them make the first move. Now use your feet, and when they go off balance, look for an opening. Boom. Like that? Yeah, yeah, that's it. Okay, Not only this time, just let me have it. Right on the jock, okay? I can <coughs> Oh, sh- the way this organically transitions into a section of Miles' gameplay sneaking past a Sable checkpoint to get to Feast is pretty darn masterful, and I'm looking forward to Insomniac bringing more moments like this to Miles' own story, even if the gameplay section is dull as dishwater. Yes, I know, I know, settle down, we'll get to the MJ and Miles missions next. Don't think about that, focus for now on how Peter Parker's duality is presented to us in the structuring of this section. 
As Spider-Man, he teaches Miles what makes an effective combatant, how to throw a punch, how to carry himself, and then moments later as Pete, he teaches this scared, nervous teenager how to be an effective citizen, how to be helpful and useful at feast. Again, some of the character work is just mwah, and no wonder. One of the lead writers was Christos Gage, who worked on some of the strongest episodes of Daredevil, a show all about its characters above its spectacle. And he was the guy who brought Superior Octopus to Marvel's pages, continuing on from Dan Slott's earlier work. The guy's talented is what I'm saying, and the scene where Miles overhears a homeless man blindly bad-mouthing his dead father, mustering the courage to say something to a grouchy, potentially violent, potentially racist old-timer just for Peter to step in and save him from needing to, is one of the best scenes in the game. Don't forget, unbeknownst to Miles, he's now working through his grief by working for the man who killed his father. Miles' uncertainty, his nerves, and now watching his face twist in conflict and pain before Pete steps in, solidifies the two as a real pairing, setting them up as mentor and student, in life as well as heroing. Speaking of heroing, Pete gets a call from Yuri to inform him that Sable are escorting the mysterious Dr. Michaels to a safe house. We follow from a distance, but the demons have another idea. A massive truck barrels through, wiping out the Sable convoy and allowing Mr. Negative to kidnap both Dr. Michaels and the Devil's Breath. Not good. This is another fantastic spectacle mission. Battling demons on top of the moving truck, webbing them up onto passing buildings is a real high, bringing us back up to the fast-paced, tense action after a few slower missions of just getting our bearings again. But before we can take the Devil's Breath back, Lee corrupts Spidey, lulling us into a psychological battle inside the webhead's mind. Here, we follow Lee through Peter Parker's dark, grizzled memory of the Osborne rally attack, showing us that this moment, this failure of Spider-Man's, is still playing at the edges of his mind. Mr. Negative is a bastard of a villain. He's been ruthless up until this point. Straight up murdered people. He's not the cartoonish, rampaging nutjobs that Spider-Man's fought before. He's more deadly, and the game uses this mission to show us how that's affected Pete's sense of heroism. Lee mocks Pete for failing to save everyone that day, and Spider-Man states, plainly for us, which leaf on that tree of with great power comes great responsibility Insomniac's story cares about. I can't save everyone. At numerous points throughout this story, Pete needs to remind himself of that. He can't save everyone. He can't be too hard on himself for his failings. He's doing what he can to help people, but when you come up against a foreboding threat like Martin Lee, sometimes failure's just part of the deal, because the terrorist attack was the first of four major failures Peter experiences in this story. As for gameplay, we have a mini boss fight with Lee. He summons spectral shadows that we fight more than punching Negative himself, and ultimately our bad guy defeats Spider-Man and escapes with the Devil's Breath. I'm gone. The Discoia. So-called superhero. You think you save people, but you just make it worse. And just in case you're keeping score, this is failure number two. While Pete licks his wounds, we cut away to Mary Jane Watson and get to experience the one legitimately good MJ mission in the game. As she muscles around a train station, we get to see a few of the things Oscorp are designing. Tech of the future, invisibility, medical drones, etc. Perhaps teasing at stuff that will appear in a future game. Now this is fine, but it isn't until Lee and his goons arrive and take the station hostage that this mission really takes off. This has to be one of my favourite missions in the game, I'm not kidding. As Mary Jane, we get to see Spider-Man from a civilian perspective. This is when the game's Miles and MJ moments are at their very best. Spidey wants to get MJ out of there, but she refuses to, remaining courageous until the very end. The mechanic of separating Lee's henchmen so that Spidey can stealthily take them down feels fresh at this, the 20 hour mark. Though once Spidey takes a goon out, he disappears, like just glitches out of existence. Surely a player is going to want to witness his agile takedowns, so this seems like a really strange oversight on Insomniac's part. The mission ends with MJ deactivating the bomb under the guidance of Peter, working against the timer, and frustratingly it's how good and tense this section is, which highlights all of the problems with the other MJ and Miles missions. 
The way MJ has been revitalised for this interpretation of Spidey has been polarising to say the least. Players get frustrated by her bullishness, insisting on sneaking into places she has no business being in because she's not a superhero and this is a superhero game. She gets annoyed with Pete for being overprotective, but anybody playing this is going to align themselves more with Spider-Man than MJ in these arguments. Of course Pete is protective. MJ just snuck into Tombstone's headquarters and the guy is fucking invulnerable. If she gets caught, she's dead. Spider-Man fights deadly, strong foes on a day-to-day -day basis and barely makes it out of alive even then, despite having super strength. Mary Jane Watson doesn't have any of his abilities. If Pete barely makes it out alive, what the hell will happen to MJ if she's caught? But despite being frustrated with her, I really like this characterization of MJ a lot. She's flawed, she's dating a superhero, she's a vigorous investigative journalist. Of course, she's not going to stand on the sidelines while the webhead investigates supervillains. Of course, on the flip side, what gets me annoyed with MJ is how she's mechanically portrayed to us in gameplay. Spider-Man PS4 stealth system needs a complete revamp for the next game. For the majority of it, all MJ can do is creep around, push over boxes with the triangle button, and occasionally throw lures to move enemies out of the way. There are no options here, no freedom or creativity in the stealth mechanics. Even the objective markers are only a few feet ahead of us at all times, funneling and directly guiding us. Despite the fact we get a stun gun for MJ later, this inclusion happens much too late in the game for it to be included in her options for these sections. So it's not just that when we play as MJ or Miles we feel disempowered, it's also because the transition is so jarring because these sections are some of the most on-rail moments of the entire game. We go from swinging about, choosing from a plethora of gadgets and choices during Spider-Man sections to pushing up on the left analogue stick and occasionally jucking a lure about. Oh, and also these seem to be a little bit buggy as well. It's boring, it's dull, and I think a lot of players would have swallowed this version of Mary Jane a lot easier if we didn't have to experience these dull mechanics as her so often. As a result, it's hard to empathise with MJ when she's ranting about how she wants to be included and taking down the bad guys more, when we experience how useless she would be in these situations firsthand. With the single exception of this train station mission, the rest of the time MJ is as useful to Spider-Man as a wet towel in a thunderstorm. I could waste your time specifically talking about Miles as well, but everything I've just said about MJ applies to him too. He's just as disenfranchised during his sections, so it makes playing as him equally as frustrating every single time. With one exception, but we will get to that later. Instead, let's look at Pete's stealth mechanics. Spider-Man's stealth system is miles better than MJ's, but it's still rough, my dudes. Using vantage points, the wall crawler can web enemies up to purchase quietly, or swing down to take out an enemy with a swift kick to the head before darting back into the shadows. We also have the impact web, everyone's favourite overpowered gadget which can just web goons to nearby surfaces immediately. It's basically an insta-kill, and of course the tripwire web's by far the most entertaining gadget in Spidey's arsenal, and your best friend during stealth mode. But that's it. Four options. Enemies all have the standard alert systems above their heads to tell you if it's safe or not to go in for a takedown, meaning stealth is basically the game's easy mode during combat encounters. The AI of enemies is essentially in the gutter. If they come across one of their pals all webbed up, they'll shout that the spider's probably here, but that's it. Their behaviours won't change, they won't start looking for you or specifically aiming at vantage points you're likely to be hanging out in. During base missions, you can wipe out the entirety of the first wave in stealth without a single goon even smelling you, but as soon as the second wave starts, every enemy in the tri-state area knows exactly where you are at all times times. It's impossible to lose enemies once they've locked onto you, meaning there isn't much in the way of strategy of manoeuvring around these foes. And honestly the main issue here is with the level design for encounters. Let's take the base missions for example. All of them are in wide open spaces, warehouses, construction sites and so on. One room with a few ledges and a couple of staircases. You can stand in one corner of the room and immediately see everything that's going on. There's no complexity here. Despite the fact Spider-Man can, for example, crawl through vents, we never use this to get the drop on enemies organically during gameplay, only during scripted moments in the main campaign. 
and it's a bloody shame. The design of these spaces need more complex machinations, security cameras, trip wires for us to watch out for, little extra rooms for us to play around in, rather than just one large entrance hall to tackle bad guys. Okay, rant over, where are we in the story? Mmm, okay, so we swing into the underground and chase Mr. Negative onto a nearby subway train. What plays out here is one of the most mechanically underwhelming moments of the game, and it's only saved by the fact we get a real boss fight with Martin Lee later on. Visually, battling Negative in a train carriage looks fantastic. The camera closes in, making this battle feel more claustrophobic than any of the others so far. Spider-Man is trapped in a metal can with a very dangerous villain. But gameplay-wise, all we're doing is watching Lee telegraph two attack types. We either jump to the roof or jump to the side, and then press the triangle button when it appears to throw some punches his way. On your first playthrough, it's almost inevitable that when the fight ends, you'll be pretty disappointed by how Lee's story comes to an end. Especially if, like me, you thought this was the climax of the story, and all of the Doc Ock stuff was being saved for the sequel. For full context, I didn't see the Raft demo because I didn't want anything else spoiled for me. Our hero is still determined to help Martin Lee here. There's no animosity. Peter still sees the good within Mr. Negative, constantly begging to just let him help. This guy has murdered tons of people up to this point. He's putting numerous New Yorkers in danger right now. He almost blew up Peter Parker's love interest. And despite all of this, Spidey still sees the good potential within. No problem. Defeating Negative, we ship him off to the raft, and Act 2 comes to a close. Crisis averted, and the monochrome man is locked away. The plot seems to be resolved, but there are still some loose ends. Weird. Act 3 opens with the world's most awkward conversation between MJ and Pete. Even though Spider-Man has, again, won the day, this tug of war between Pete and his webby counterpart is front and centre. His relationship with his ex has suffered as a direct result of his efforts as Spider-Man. Please say no, please say no. Huh. Okay, okay. You might be thinking that it's strange the story still seems to be going at this point, and then we go to see Octavius. He's officially designed his octopus arms. Doc highlights that Peter's work in the neural web was the key. Peter Parker has finally created Dr. Octopus. Now, Doc's villain turn officially launches us into the final act. He's our true big bad, not Martin Lee, and this is Peter's third major failure. He's been so focused on his alter ego, on succeeding as Spider-Man, on taking down Martin Lee, that he hasn't paid enough attention to Otto, completely missing his descent into madness, and the outcome is as effective and impactful as it is tragic. Otto is the third character in this tale which embodies a duality of personalities. Peter Parker and Spider-Man, Martin Lee's pure soul versus Mr. Negative's darkness, and now Otto Octavius, the man who just wanted to help people, has been twisted and malformed into a being of pure hatred and madness. This immediately climaxes with the famous Raft mission. This is 20 minutes of pure, unbridled spectacle, battling through our newest enemy faction, the Raft Prisoners. Note that I stated enemy faction here rather than enemy types, because ultimately all of these enemies are just the thugs and demons we've battled already with orange jumpsuits and occasionally, for some reason, blue skin. The framing of a prison breakout is a violent, high-octane race against time, and this is one hell of a way to start a final act. We chase Electro around the outskirts of the raft, and eventually meet the rest of the Sinister... Five. Scorpion, Rhino, Electro, Vulture, and Mr. Negative kick Spidey into the dirt. It seems that he might just be able to fight back until the team's sixth member steps out of the darkness. And everything goes to hell.
first and final warning. Stay out of our way. Okay, let's talk about the Sinister Six. We've already covered Dr. Octopus, but seeing him in Times Square fulfilling Mr. Negative's failed goal to release the Devil's Breath is a simple, visual way to portray him as a bigger, badder version of our previous main antagonist. In the space of hours, Ock has achieved what has taken Martin Lee weeks to plot and plan. His genius is front and centre here, and the ultimate irony to truly showcase his cruelty is that the first people he gasses are people protesting Norman Osborn. It's been effectively built up that the release of this thing is terrifying, and as Ock puts on a gas mask, officially forming his comic book villain look, we realise that this is it. Our hero has lost. All because Peter was too focused with his Spider-Man-ing, he didn't see the madness right under his own nose. As for Mr. Negative, there's not much to comment on in this sequence. He's essentially been cucked by Octavius' ascension. We'll return to him when we get to his boss fight in the next section. With regards to the other four, one of the greatest criticisms levied against Spider-Man PS4 is that suddenly all of the really, really good stuff is held captive until the final act. Electro, Vulture, Scorpion, and Rhino suddenly appear with very little in the way of introduction, and yes, the, the pacing does feel off here, but I disagree that the four villains don't get much in the way of introduction. Our first seconds of the game showcase Spidey's old villains. They are constantly referenced if you listen to just the facts, and almost all of the villains get just enough time to breathe before we take them down, with the single unfortunate exception of Vulture. See, Spidey goes to Times Square to track down Octavius, and we enter into our third and final, thankfully, section where we wander into a villain lair and get their motivation explained to us. Getting a rundown on how he's recruited each member of the Sinister Six, such as wiping Scorpion's debts, is at least development, but it's as shamefaced as the PowerPoint on Devil's Breath we saw earlier. Again, a lot of the early development for the Sinister Six is there if you're looking for it, a little detail in the environment such as the new tech in Octavius' lab earlier in the game, but making this a tad more explicit in the main storyline would have gone a long way. The entirety of Act 3 is focused on taking on these villains one by one, opening with a fantastic mission where we essentially need to swing around New York, cleaning up the destruction left in the wake of Electro and Rhino's respective rampages. Electro section is solid, as it feels specific to him. We need to neutralise junction boxes, at least in keeping with the feel of him as a villain. Rhino section is less so. It just boils down to fighting standard goons in the street or on rooftops. There's nothing Rhino specific about this. Our boss fights, however, are sculpted by each villain's feel. If you've watched my video rewriting Marvel's Avengers, you know I love a good doubling up of bosses, so seeing our nasty boys paired off was very satisfying. The aerial battle against Vulture and Electro is one of the most entertaining moments of the game. It's just a shame that this is the first time Spider-Man gets a basic conversation with Vulture in the entire story. A brief chase mission where maybe, I don't know, Vulture breaks out of the raft and we have to chase him down in Act 2 would have mitigated this sense of homelessness when it comes to Spider-Man's relationship with Vulture. But hey, at least the aerial combat is fun. Swinging around the Oscorp power plant, dodging Electro's lightning of Vulture's, um, actually what are these? Well, it's fun anyway, even if it does showcase that some further depth in the aerial combat is needed here. Remember, dodge, triangle, square, 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 dodge. Hell, if you want perhaps a finisher, it could be used too. Again, much like the rest of the game, it's the presentation and the tone which saves this fight and makes it feel great. And, of course, the uniqueness of not being on the ground for this battle. Rhino and Scorpion are more expertly handled. Both get some serious screen time before we finally take them down. Scorpion poisons us and we have to swing through a hallucinatory city with tails rising ominously out of the mist, dodging them as they lash out at us and hot damn, again, I'm reminded of how fun Mysterio will be as a villain in the sequel. Whilst Scorpion's mission works as a solid introduction to him, as a boss he's the easiest member of the Sinister Six to battle. You chuck an impact web at him, he falls over, you hit him a bit, rinse and repeat. It's clear that the dream sequence's purpose is less to have fun with Scorpion as a villain, and more to reinforce Pete's internal conflict after creating Dr. Octopus. Visions of our old mentor haunt us, blaming us for his transformation and descent into madness, but through it all, Pete is clinging to this sense that Octavius is sick, and that he intends to help him. 
But we know, because we've seen this before, that Spider-Man can't save everyone. Scorpion's section ends with Pete standing in his boxers in Octavius' lab, a light-hearted breather after watching Spidey suffer pretty intensely. But this is the game's final act, and it's about to get all kinds of stressful. Pete goes to check in on May. She's sick. She's clearly caught the Devil's Breath illness. She says she's fine, and if you're anything like me during your first playthrough, you might just believe her. Oh, there. <coughs> I'm okay. Didn't you tell me something once about accepting that I'm human just like everyone else? You and Ben. <coughs> Masters at turning my own words against me. Aunt May's in danger? Pfft, please. This is just an artificial way to raise the stakes. Come on, Insomniac, you're better than that. You really want me to think you'd kill Aunt May? Yeah, I know, but this is legitimately what I thought. Please, tell me I wasn't alone. Out of our four Raft villains, Rhino gets by far the best introduction. Just like with MJ's train station mission and how that effectively portrays Spider-Man from the perspective of a civilian, Miles' mission creeping through the ship containers sincerely grounds how monstrous some of Spidey's villains look from the perspective of everyday citizens. The camera angle is closed in on Miles, and whilst there is absolutely zero creativity for us here, the lack of freedom just plays into how terrifying the sequence truly is. Miles doesn't have much at his fingertips to take on this hulking beast. We know that Spider-Man is miles away, pun intended, at the Feast Center. We feel exposed. This is juxtaposed by the Rhino-Scorpion boss fight later. Not only is this battle fucking hilarious in how Rhino and Scorpion are just ribbing each other the entire fight, calling each other thick, weak, or puny, but Spider-Man's environmental options have been upgraded a tad for this fight, swinging heavy containers at Rhino to take him out. It would have been all too easy to fall into the classic battle of make big guy run into wall, big guy stuns themselves here. Insomniac make this a more active battle, where we have to actively interrupt Rhino's charge attack rather than just dodging out of the way, and I respect that. As for Scorpion, he, again, unfortunately, isn't given much more in the way of intricacies here. He's more of a nuisance while we challenge Rhino. If it wasn't for the attention devoted to Scorpion in his hallucinatory sequence, I would have argued that this is cheap, but... Well, you know, I, I just said it. They devoted attention to Scorpion in his Listen Notori sequence, so it doesn't feel cheap. I don't really know how to end this argument, so let's just... The final hour of the game begins with the weirdest fucking call between Spidey and MJ. I've been through the city, state, and federal databases. If this Devil's Breath Lab does exist, it's off the books. The only other place I can think to look is in Norman's personal files. I've already been through his office computer. Are you thinking his penthouse? That building's full of Sables, man. If they spot me, other residents could get hurt in a firefight. I know, but I might be able to get in undetected. I can sneak in, find the lab's location, and get out. If anything goes wrong, I'll call you for backup. Okay. This entire mission grinds the pacing to a halt. We've just spent a couple of hours battling some of Spider-Man's greatest villains. We want to go and take down Mr. Negative and Dr. Octopus, not sneak around Norman Osborn's penthouse as Mary Jane friggin' Watson. The reasoning behind this is, at best, inane as well. Some of the weakest writing of the game happens during this phone call. Spider-Man claims that he can't go to Osborn's penthouse because if he gets caught, people could get hurt in the firefight. What the hell makes MJ any less likely to be caught by the Sable Men? Surely the guy who can crawl through vents and along a rooftop is better suited for stealth than a reporter with zero powers. Stupid. Seriously, if Insomniac just raised the ceiling a little further to handle Spider-Man's camera, this could have been one of the best stealth moments of the whole game. There are two large rooms, some smaller areas which could have been connected via vents, but instead we're stuck with MJ. It's a damn shame. As Mary Jane, we explore Osborne's penthouse, sneaking around Sable Guards while they hunt for us. We learn that Harry Osborne isn't in Europe, he's actually sick with the same illness which killed his mother. Devil's Breath was being developed to cure him. There's a gorgeous, emotional moment where we learn how badly Norman misses his wife, and that he makes a point of speaking to the memory of her every single year, adding further dimensions to him as a villain, and contributing some solid setup for a sequel. 
However, the layers added to Norman Osborn are momentarily stripped away when we see precisely why Martin Lee hates him so much. Both Osborn and Octavius experimented on Lee years ago, granting him powers, but also killing his parents in the process. The most interesting facet of this is the inclusion of Otto. Up until now, we've seen him as a purely benevolent character who has descended into evil, but this clip shows us that Otto was always capable of cruelty. Perhaps his efforts to create a new robotic prosthetic for veterans was his way of trying to make amends for the horrors he inflicted when working alongside Osborn. It's also here that MJ accidentally catches a stowaway, an Oscorp spider which carries a similar power set to Peter. Once MJ escapes the penthouse, Pete finally gives in and acknowledges he should treat her as an equal partner in their saving the day antics, and whilst this felt inevitable for their relationship to be strengthened again, I just wish the mission leading into this was stronger, because after sneaking around Osborne's home and getting killed by Sable Guards, I do not think MJ is as valuable in taking down the bad guys as Pete. There's an inevitable power dynamic here, and again, I wouldn't feel this strongly about it if the game hadn't forced me to actually experience this power dynamic. There isn't much time for Pete and MJ to make kissy faces though, because this is where the endgame officially begins. Martin Lee has captured Norman Osborn, so we need to go and stop him. We finally get a real boss fight with Mr. Negative, and it's pretty great, all things considered. It magnanimously makes up for the NAF train battle earlier. Lee questions why Spider-Man wants to save scum like Osborn, and Spidey doesn't answer, but we know why. It's because Spider-Man tries to save everyone, no matter who they are, and this is reinforced through how the webhead keeps yelling that he's trying to save Lee from the darkness within him. The reason why this boss fight stands out is actually primarily because Mr. Negative isn't completely invulnerable to our basic attacks. Rather, us not being able to hurt him at all until we've stunned him with gadgets and environmental objects, if our dodge game is on point, we can use that against him to get a fair few blows in. This fight feels a lot more natural, a lot more fair, but also pretty damn challenging as well. Lee summons some lesser enemies again to try and ambush us, but Spidey can take each one down in one hit, so they're more set dressing than a distraction from the battle itself. When all is said and done, Mr. Negative is one of the strongest boss fights in the game, which feels pretty darn appropriate considering we technically face off against him three times, and he's touted for most of the game as our greatest foe. Taking him down doesn't feel satisfying for very long though, because it's not long before Doc Ock arrives, brutally knocks Spider-Man out, and steals Osborne and the Devil's Breath cure to take miles away. Spidey falls unconscious and Silver Sable saves the day by carrying him to Feast, where Dr. Michaels works to save him. At any point, any of these people could remove Spider-Man's mask, but they don't. It's not quite as powerful as Sam Raimi's train scene, but it's still nice to have it clearly acknowledged that New York cares about Spider-Man. The good people of Feast, our new friend Sable, the doctors working on Spidey, none of them even think about removing the mask of exposing Peter Parker. However, pacing again is an issue here. I honestly should have like a buzzer or something. This entire scene could be, and I would argue should be, removed. The only reason it's here is so we can see that Aunt May is officially dying, which could have been introduced before the Martin Lee boss fight. Realistically, our boss battle with Lee should have been followed up with an immediate boss battle with Doc Ock. Instead, the story slows down again and plods along before our characters feel like they're ready to end the tale. Go get him, Tiger. However, I've said it before and I will say it again, a little bit of cheese goes a long way with a superhero story like this one. So the simple addition of go get him tiger, directly referencing the awkward date Pete and MJ had earlier is honestly enough to fill us with a badass sense of fuck yeah, we can do this, before launching into the final fight with Dr. Octopus. As preparation for this fight, Pete goes back to Octavius's lab where this all started for the pair, and uses his genius to design a new suit capable of taking on Doc Ock. The story waves this away as being extremely durable, made of similar material as Doc's arms, which is great, but gameplay-wise, it regenerates our gadgets, something which is very handy because we need our webbing to take down the octopus. Otto has taken Osborne hostage at Oscorp Tower, try and saying that five times fast. 
Despite the fact that the game has many threads waiting to be resolved, it all ends with a simple Baddy takes the mayor hostage trope, and I absolutely love this. The setting of the battle tastes like a climax, bleakly painted against the night sky. The fact that this location will have more gameplay relevance for someone who is engaged with the research stations, which teaches us it's basically one massive electricity conductor, makes this final face-off intrinsically powerful for Peter, Otto, and the player. Ox boss fight is full of variety. We have to swing from antenna to antenna, we have to dodge missiles, use our gadgets, environmental attacks. Ox packs a powerful punch, and just like with Mr. Negative, we can still smack him upside the head if he isn't stunned. Using our webs, the goal here is to generally web Ock up so he can face a few decent punches. We can't stop to breathe, and on my first playthrough I admit I died a couple of times here. And what you're seeing on screen isn't selling the moment enough. Just listen to the theme music. The use of the heavy brass really gives a sense of weight to the action, like Ox's dangerous arms smashing down and interrupting the more agile, spindly string section, reminiscent of Spider-Man. The use of the choir belting out to Latin in the background is a tad melodramatic, but considering Insomniac is taking a lot of cues from the Raimi films above all else, it's fitting with the tone. And the huge reveal that Octavius knows Spider-Man and Peter Parker are one and the same feels inevitable once the immediate shock subsides. Pete is filled with rage. It's in this climax that the duality between Peter Parker and Spider-Man becomes one. With the revelation that Otto knew his identity all along, the two sides align with each other. As we enter into the third and final wave of the fight, a good old-fashioned brawl along the side of Oscorp Tower, the pain and hurt in Pete is effervescent. He feels responsible. He was so focused on Mr. Negative that he didn't see Octavius's villainous side begin to eke out, and that pain and betrayal is reflected in Otto as well. As he says when the fight is over, Pete should be on his side. They were friends, partners. Otto designed Spider-Man's new suit for the game, for Christ's sake. I mean, Pete designed Otto's neural transmitter. It was all going so well for the two of them until Devil's Breath. Do everything I can. I'll make sure you get the best help. No! If they put me away, they'll take my arms! I'll be trapped in this useless body! Please, Peter. That wasn't me. You said you'd never abandon me. You promised. Remember? And of course, you rest easy, knowing your secret is safe with me. You do what you think is best, Doc. It's all any of us can. And as Peter leaves Otto behind, the anti-serum in his hand, a strange thought struck me. Not a single villain dies in this game. It's all too common for Spider-Man villains to die by their own hand in Spidey adaptations, but in Spider-Man PS4, every single villain is just locked up. The ultimate irony when the credits roll is that a lot of people die in this game, a lot of good people, but Spider-Man sticks to his code. You can't save everyone, but that doesn't mean you shouldn't try, and he weirdly succeeds with his villains. <sighs> but as we all know, if you've played the game, he fails with Aunt May. The death of May is one of the most perfectly executed scenes in the game, and it brings a tear to my eye every single time. The fact that Peter has to make a choice, very similar to at the start of the game. In the opening few moments there, Pete had to decide between Peter Parker's life or Spider-Man's responsibilities, his bills or the kingpin. Here, he has to decide between May and New York. And just like with his bills in those opening moments, we get a split second where it looks like he'll choose Peter Parker's life, but he holds himself back. To quote the game, he has to be the man who makes all the right decisions, even if it hurts like hell. 
I love as well that we second with Mary Jane in the doorway, almost out of shot, where she decides to give the two of them their last moments together. I love that Peter thinks he'll have to be with May in her last moments as Spider-Man rather than her nephew, but most of all, I love that in her last moments, May gives Peter one last gift. She takes that burden from him. She confesses that she always knew he was Spider-Man. Side note, if you want a peek behind the curtain, here are what my notes looked like for this scene. I have a lot more to say about the death of Aunt May, but I think it can be summed up by the phrase Aunt May is a fucking icon circled like a thousand times, so we'll leave it there. Fading to black and ending our story here might have been a tad too dark. Peter has learned a new part of his mantra of with great power comes great responsibility. The duality between he and Spider-Man has ended in the death of his mother figure and he's battled not one but two enemies which reflected this back to him, but it's all a wee bit depressing. So it's nice that our final moments cut to three months later. MJ and Pete meet up in their favourite cafe from earlier. MJ is now associate editor of the Daily Bugle and ultimately asks Pete if he wants to move in with her. And honestly, thank God this scene exists. We've just played an entire game where every win for Spider-Man is a blow to Peter, so it's nice that after all of the loss and heartbreak, Peter gets to win one. He gets to move in with Mary Jane Watson. The two seem to be healthy again. The status quo has changed, but it's in a stable place for now. There are a lot of balls for Insomniac to be fondling by the time the credits officially roll in the main game, not to mention the DLC, but I have confidence they'll be able to manage the future at least as well as they did with the writing of this game. Speaking of the DLC... You seem to have a lot of women in your life lately. And all of them challenging. Except for you, of course. I didn't really give Yuri and Sable the love they deserved while discussing the main game, so I'm going to discuss their characters here alongside a wider overview of the DLC. In retrospect, I like the City That Never Sleeps DLC more now than I did when it first released. As a season pass, it launched for £20 UK, and there's quite a bit in the way of story and content here that I think justifies that price point. However, there is a lot which is set up in here for future games that I'm not sure whether or not it's fair such a crucial part of the world's story was sold as a separate item. I'd go so far as to say that story-wise, this is a must-play if you care about the world, characters, and specifically this iteration of Spider-Man. The DLC in total answers questions raised in the main campaign, such as where the hell is Black Cat, and divine retribution like a screwball boss fight was saved for this as well. We're not going to walk through every inch of the DLC like we did with the main campaign, but there are some interesting story beats that are worth discussing. The opening moments of the heist has one of my favourite level designs of the entire game. The crime families have all started to grow more confident now Fisk and the demons are put away, so Spidey gets a call that there's a break-in at the Museum of Contemporary Modern Art. It's an open area, sure, but it's segmented with walls blocking enemies away from each other so you can break down conflicts while also facing off against waves of these enemies. Web zipping through tactically placed vents in the walls allows us to leap through, tackle four enemies, leap back, web up a few more, and keep the battle feeling busy while not overwhelming us like you might end up feeling in, for example, the Sable Camps in the main game. And tossing priceless pieces of art at thugs is a riot, though it kind of undermines the side objective of trying to stop some goons from stealing some of these said art pieces. I'm gonna have to call you right back. Why? What's going on? You look good. <laughs> Been working out? No. Oh. I mean, you know, a little. So, you swinging solo now? Or back with your ex? That's a lot of questions. This is by far my favorite rendition of Black Cat ever. The best pieces of music in the game are by far Spidey's hero theme which harks back to the Raimi era while still being unique, Doc Ock's boss theme which is foreboding and ominous, and Black Cat's theme which is delicate and cheeky. Over the course of the heist, we and Peter are sucked into Felicia's world. 
Her manipulation of Spider-Man by claiming she has a son, and worse, that Peter's the father, is pretty callous when you think about it, and it's worth acknowledging that the way she treats Pete in this story is borderline abusive. She gaslights him, lies to him, stitches him up, and at the end ghosts him in the extreme by faking her death. She's as aloof here as her comic book counterpart, and if you're a fan of femme fatales, oh boy, let me tell you, Black Cat is the most femme of them all. The reveal that Pete and Felicia had an official sexual history is a neat twist, and it gives the writers an opportunity to present Pete and MJ as extremely healthy in comparison. It isn't long before Pete bravely confesses everything to MJ. Total honesty is important between these two, and MJ has natural reservations, potentially dating the father of Black Cat's son. But soon, the two of them accept that this may just need to be another facet of their relationship, and I really, really love the intricate details that we notice in their conversations here. But the City That Never Sleeps DLC also introduces a brand new mini-arc for Peter to follow through the three chapters. The concept of fatherhood is introduced with Felicia. He begins to panic about having a son. He and MJ both consider the type of dad he would be. After all, Pete can barely look after himself, never mind a child. This is reinforced through the side mission where we collect paintings across the city whilst learning about Walter Hardy, Felicia's father, and the original Black Cat. Introducing this concept through Felicia is clever because even though it all turns out to be bullshit, the colour of Peter as a father has been established to be capitalised on in his relationship with Miles. Over the course of the DLC, we have numerous conversations between Pete and Miles where the former is, reluctantly, mentoring the latter, and this all coalesces at the end where the two of them begin to officially train. Whilst the plot of The City That Never Sleeps is all about Hammerhead, the story is actually all about our hero becoming the auto to Miles' Peter, and as a result, the DLC feels like a natural extension of the main campaign, rather than its own self-contained story. In saying that, the DLC, much like the main game, is greater than the sum of its parts, because, again, the pacing is a little bit of a mess here. A lot of our main missions are introductions to the mediocre side content which comes with the game. With its story, the heist also introduces three new suits, the Walter Hardy Collectathon, a new enemy type in the minigun enemy, and the Screwball Challenges. I fucking love the Screwball Challenges. I do. I'm, I'm sorry, I don't even care. They're as good, if not slightly better, than the Taskmaster ones. For now, we have beat-em-ups, EMP challenges, drone challenges, gadget challenges, and with the later episodes, stealth challenges are introduced as well. The gadget challenges are specifically quite a bit of fun. I wish there were a couple more of these, if I'm being honest, and I hope we get something like this more fleshed out in the sequel, restricting us to just needing to use two particular gadgets to take down enemies is a lot of fun, and forcing the player to start thinking about the environment more creatively is fan-fucking-tastic. A particular highlight is needing to use the suspension matrix to launch enemies into the air, and then activating a tripwire to slap them to a surface made me see these gadgets in a brand new way that the main game never did. And whilst everybody hates Screwball, it could be worse guys, she could be Bad Bunny. The whole gimmick of the photobombs brings a dynamic twist to typical challenges, separating Screwball's missions from Taskmasters by making them feel quite unique, and building her up as an irritating villain makes it all the more sweeter when we finally take her down later. We also get a new active crime in the form of bomb defusal using the Spiderbot. Yeah, you probably forgot Spiderbot existed until I mentioned it here, didn't you? At certain moments in the main game, we jump into a first-person view of a little robotic spider buddy to run around in. These sections are about as forgettable as you'd imagine, but at least it brings a legitimate new crime type to the table, so I can't fault that too much. Even if there is barely any challenge to these. I'll come back to Spider-Bot's best moment in a wee bit when I jump into the second episode. Towards the end of the heist, the plot becomes crystal clear for us. 
Hammerhead has been forcing Felicia to steal some digital drives, which have the major assets of all the local crime families on them. Much like with the main game, this isn't exactly a unique superhero plot, but what we're really here for is the relationship between Spidey and Black Cat, and the DLC handles this very well in both story and gameplay. We have a combat section and a stealth section with Felicia, pretty much back to back. This is the first NPC to help us in a fight since Jefferson Davis, and I'm glad it's here, but this is Black Cat, guys. She doesn't do much other than chuck down some flashbangs, which often becomes more of an annoyance than anything else. Thankfully, they solved this later with Silver Sable, but for now, this is a slight letdown. The same applies to the stealth mission. This essentially boils down to pressing the right directional button to ask her to take down some goons. And the issue here is that you can't screw this up and just send her in to take someone down if it puts her into danger. The option only ever appears if it's safe for her to leap down, which kills some of the potential challenge. We don't need to be aware of enemy placement here, we just need to pan the camera until the little icon appears. And about 10 minutes after this mission, the game ends. Felicia betrays us, we learn that her son is a load of bullshit, and that she's about to die because Hammerhead has rigged her penthouse to explode as revenge for crossing him. As Spidey, we race across the city to warn her, but before we get there, she goes up in smoke and... dies. What an abrupt ending. And worst of all, there is no Black Cat boss fight. Well, there's kind of a boss fight, I guess. Early in the game, we have a fantastic chase through the city using three stages to structure it, but it's all still a pretty weak ending. Thankfully, the other DLCs only get better from there. If the heist is all about Felicia Hardy, Turf Wars is all about Yuri Watanabe. The episode opens with a fantastic set piece, laying siege to Hammerhead's headquarters in the Harlem Sanitarium. This is much more scripted than the heist's museum level, but fighting our way through the sanatorium alongside the NYPD really solidifies the sense that in the days since New York was saved from Devil's Breath, Spider-Man has fully embraced his role as Spider-Cop. Meaning when Hammerhead is introduced to us, we don't feel like we're too big for a crime boss. Hands behind your head! How about no? Captain, I'm sorry. Do it! Now! There it is. There's the fear. Over the next two hours of gameplay, we are going to witness firsthand the origin story of Yuri Watanabe's costumed alter ego, Wraith. Hammerhead is presented as a takes-no-prisoners type of villain. He's remained quiet in the days since Fisk went away, but now he's popping his ugly, massive head out of the window and shaking his ass at the people of New York, essentially goading Spidey into facing him. Or at least that's what he claims, because he spends most of his time hiding underground, watching his men do the dirty work for him. And it's worth mentioning that a lot of time and energy clearly into making the Hammerhead gang feel different from the other enemy factions in the game. Honestly, it would have been all too easy to just throw some standard thugs our way, or write it off as Hammerhead hired some raft prisoners to work for him, but Insomniac wrote new dialogue, got new voice actors with the typical mafioso accents, and designed a few new looks for these standard enemies, even if they are mechanically the same as the other factions. Turf Wars also introduces a second enemy type for us to tackle. Insomniac saw that everyone loved the irritating jetpack enemies and the bothersome shield enemies and thought, huh, Let's combine the two and ruin everyone's day. And oh boy, do they ruin everyone's day. These guys can... suck a dick. You can't use the tried and true strategies for the shield enemies because their asshole rush attack leaves behind a red energy field which hurts and staggers you, so you've got to rethink your plan of attack with them. They're not poorly designed on their own by any stretch, but all too often you have to face four or five of them at the same time whilst also trying to handle the minigun enemy. Nowhere is this clearer than in the Hammerhead fronts. Turf Wars introduces a new base type for us to challenge ourselves in. These are a welcome addition, but hot damn if these aren't tough. Each wave has a plethora of high-end enemies, but again, the issues with stealth are front and centre here. As soon as you stealthily take down the first wave of enemies, you have to contend with four more waves of like 50 goons, now with miniguns, jetpacks, shields, whips and the like. 
Speaking of stealth, Screwball's stealth challenges are a most welcome addition as well. Seriously, it's, it's hard to really hate her as a villain when her in-game challenges are legitimately great fun. Screwball stealth missions introduce motion sensors into the mix. If you're caught in them, it's an insta-fail, and you can web them up to momentarily blind them, and all I want, please, Insomniac, I'm not dicking about here. Miles Morales comes out days from now. All I want is for these to be used in future stealth missions without the insta-fail, but for enemy AI to react to us being spotted in them. Please, God, please, please, I'm begging. As far as the tone, of Turf Wars is concerned, Spider Cop is the name of the game. The webhead spends a lot of the DLC tailing, eavesdropping, and following Magia thugs, and nowhere showcases that more than one of the best, slow missions of the entire game, the Spiderbot mission in the bar with no name. For those of you who don't know, the bar with no name is a direct location often used in the comics. It's not just a hidey hole for gangsters and thugs, it's ultimately where a lot of Spidey's big bads spend their nights off. Purely because of the detail in the location, for example the Kingpin arcade machine we have to hide beneath, this mission is a standout, and it's effective in setting up a location that's full of life and is actually pretty fun. I mean, I'd have a drink here, before we return to it later and see the carnage Yuri has exacted on the residents. Speaking of Yuri, the episode ends at a construction site. We get a boss fight with Hammerhead, which honestly is barely worth commenting on. He's dressed in some sable armour, meaning his body is impenetrable, but his head is exposed. The problem is, that big metal plate in his forehead, meaning on the whole, his outsides are pretty tough to put a dent in. He basically acts as a tougher version of the shield jetpack enemies who have gotten on our nerves for the past two hours. He summons lesser foes as well, and whilst I'm glad this episode at least has a boss fight, it's what comes after which is memorable, rather than the battle with Hammerhead himself. Last time we met, you said something about fear. How do you feel now? <laughs> Just dandy. <laughs> Yuri Watanabe has been our person in the chair for the entirety of the main story, and by the time this DLC comes to a close, she can no longer be that. I've seen some claims that her arc is rushed here, funneling it into just the second episode rather than spreading it out over the entirety of the city that never sleeps. I understand those claims. Yuri doesn't really have much of an arc in the base game other than, you could argue, lightening up a tad with her interactions with Spider-Man. Almost every conversation we have with Yuri, she sounds stressed, and honestly, when she finally does snap here at the climax of Turf Wars, I get it. The presentation of Hammerhead's introduction at the start with the fractured lightning, the murder of the cute dad who got a Spider-Man watch for his birthday, makes him immediately terrifying, so Yuri's quest for revenge is not only understandable, but impactful. Considering the events of this year, and the fact that Wraith is basically a vigilante cop who murders criminals, I'm interested to know which direction Insomniac takes her in the future, and how they handle that evolution. But of course, Hammerhead isn't dead, which brings us to Silver Linings, the climax of the DLC, and the entirety of Spider-Man PS4's story. If the title doesn't give it away, the opening moments of Silver Linings make it clear that, of course, this is a Silver Sable story where Spider-Man's just along for the ride. Judging it purely as a climax of the City That Never Sleeps DLC, it's 90% there. Elements are introduced to be capitalised on in future games. Felicia, Yuri, Sable, Hammerhead and Miles are all given a next step in their respective journeys, and the final battle with Hammerhead is easily one of the strongest bosses in the entire game. Speaking of bosses, we're barely 10 minutes in and we already have a much needed battle with Silver Sable. She's returned to New York because she's gotten word that Hammerhead has stolen her technology and weaponry, and in typical Sable fashion, she thinks that Spider-Man's to blame somehow. She's been listening too much to Jameson's radio show. In the base game, Sable is essentially just a threatening gun for hire who locks heads with the webhead at a few random points where he stops her from killing someone. As the story progresses, she eventually helps Spidey just before taking down Lee and awkwardly admits that we've inspired her to rethink the work her mercenaries are doing across the world. She returns to her country, presumably never to be seen again. 
But this time she's back, and she's pissed. Insomniac have gone on the record as stating they had a lot of Sable content originally planned but ultimately decided to cut it to avoid pacing issues, and I can respect that. To be honest, the original campaign would have been just fine without Silver Sable's very presence, but we needed a way to bring in tougher enemies in the final act somehow, and seeing her was a solid bit of fan service, even if she didn't have much in the way of personality until now. You'd be forgiven as well for mistaking Sable's boss fight for Taskmasters. I can't shake the feeling that perhaps this was crammed into the DLC at the last minute because so many were vocalising how disappointed they were that we didn't get to fight her in the base game, and as a result, ended up flipping Taskmaster and adding a couple of new mechanics to it. If we get too close to Sable during our fight and she isn't stunned, she'll flip us with ease, meaning we need to, you guessed it, focus on gadgets and throwing environmental objects her way to stun her before leaping in for a few attacks and then leaping away. It's a shame we didn't get more from this, but the later boss fight absolutely makes up for it. But we will get there. A new enemy type isn't introduced for the final episode, but all of Hammerhead's goons are now coated in sable armour for this final battle, meaning every standard enemy is immediately ten times more difficult to take down. This is front and centre in the Olympus bases, another base addition to the city that never sleeps, and by far the most challenging so far. Their layouts are much more open, and the game simply increases the number of high damage, difficult to take down enemies to keep us on our toes. I would go so far as to say that the Olympus bases are some of the biggest challenges in the game. Our NPC assistant here is David Obademi, introduced with the sole purpose of humanising Sable. He's on a mission to rescue the humanitarian supplies stolen by Hammerhead's crew, and our ultimate reward for conquering the three Olympus bases is getting our new pal a work visa at a school in New York. It's a lovely ending, and whilst there isn't much in the way of a new gameplay reward, the narrative reward is pretty fulfilling, adding some grey to Sable's stark colour palette. Speaking of narrative rewards, Silver Linings also gives us our long-awaited showdown with Screwball. Completing all of her challenges results in a city-wide chase across the rooftops, and this is by far the best chase in the whole game, well worth the wait. Again, it's frustrating that this content wasn't in the base game, but examining Marvel's Spider-Man as a full package, it's a great conclusion to the screwball story. For a start, this chase is not on rails, it feels much freer than any of the other races against time, and incorporates a lot of her earlier challenges, feeling like a natural escalation. We have to use her photobomb opportunities, deactivating bombs, flying through water tanks, shooting down drones, and so on, so we can keep pace with Screwball. If the Olympus bases are the ultimate test of our combat skills, Screwball's final mission is the ultimate test of our web swinging. We also get a new collectathon here. Yuri Watanabe leaves a set of recordings for us to find, and sends Spidey on a crime scene tour following the story of how she and a therapist tried to take down a Magia Enforcer, which ultimately resulted in Yuri's friend being shot and killed. I love that the strings and ropes we follow are in the colours of Wraith, and our final call with Yuri where she forlornly tells us to stay out of her way and she'll continue killing criminals is a great place to leave her tale, still shrouded in mystery but with a revolution officially complete. As for the story of Silver Linings, a lot of it is weighed down by padding. We are forced into engaging with this side content again as main missions, rather than it being left as optional content. Things don't really ramp up until the last 30 minutes, but when the story gets going, it really gets going. Spidey and Sable working together to tackle Hammerhead is endearing, and their relationship is believably developed to the point where they end the story as reluctant colleagues rather than friends. Carbon steel. Super strong, pretty sensitive to heat. I have an idea. And whilst we get, oh my god, another goddamn villain lair with recorders and blueprints which just spell out our villain's motivation and plans, bringing our total count up to four by the way, battling alongside Sable in this section is by far the best use of an NPC helping us in combat in the entire game. Sable does some real damage in this sequence, actively kicking henchmen ass, and if this is an inclination of where Insomniac is going with missions of these types, I'm excited for what comes next. Black Cat gets a brief resolution as well. She saves Spider-Man's life after Hammerhead wipes the webhead and Silver Sable out, arguably making amends for betraying Pete in the heist DLC. 
She also passes on some information which will make Hammerhead particularly weak. His skull can be damaged by extreme heat, which sets us up nicely for Hammerhead's boss fight. Battling Hammerhead at the end of Silver Linings is mechanically the best boss fight in the entire story, DLC or otherwise. Whilst Doc Ock has more of an emotional resonance and fighting Rhino and Scorpion in the docks has a lot of flavour to it, neither of these fights come close to the challenge or the testing of your durability like this one does. Hammerhead in his exoskeleton is now a complete monstrosity. He has a small handful of deadly moves. He throws bombs into the air for area of effect damage, meaning you need to be constantly moving, swinging around the outskirts of Sable's hovercraft. He has a laser, which can be activated faster than most armed enemies in the game. There's only about half a second between him levelling it at you and actually firing it for a good chunk of damage. The fight follows two waves. At first it's a simple sparring match between us and Hammerhead. We need to weaken his exoskeleton so we can hold him in place for Sable to burn a hole into his face. Not only can we hurt him without webbing him up, showing some real growth from Insomniac's combat design from the base game, but working together with Silver Sable really feels like Spidey and his gruff pal have come to an understanding at last, and this is continued into the second wave when Sable drops bombs which we need to pick up and swing at Hammerhead to reduce his shield. Whilst it falls into the camp of throwing an environmental object so we can harm them boss, this one works because it's reacting to Sable's contribution to the combat, rather than picking up pieces of rubble. The entirety of Sable's ship is our playground, but we can't just swing away from the mobster in the hopes that we can regenerate health because he can leap up to vantage points and snipe us from a distance. We need to get in at Hammerhead and focus our attention on dodging his attacks, getting some fair wax in and dodging again. It's all about our ability to read the space around us as well as marking how Hammerhead telegraphs his moves. It's a fantastic fight, and I'm praying we see more stuff like this in the sequel. Speaking of sequels, let's examine everything which is now waiting to be capitalised on in later games. I just want to state for the record that now that Insomniac has killed Aunt May, nobody is safe. Yuri, MJ, Black Cat, J. Jonah Jameson, it doesn't matter who they are, this Spider-Man universe has officially introduced real stakes for us to contend with in later stories. We find some goblin grenades in Norman Osborn's penthouse, and this, combined with the Oscorp technology MJ found in the train expo earlier, harbours the possibility for Norman Osborn to become the Green Goblin in a later game. We also have the question of Harry Osborn dying from some strange illness, but it's revealed to us in a post credit scene that Norman is using the Venom symbiote to keep him alive, so we ought to see Venom in a sequel as well. Now, while I'm as excited to see this unique twist on Venom as the next guy, and it's a great teaser to whet our appetite with, in retrospect I kinda hate this reveal. Just imagine how cool a mystery would be in Spider-Man 2. Venom has appeared for the first time in this canon. Who's wearing the suit? Is it Eddie Brock? Flash Thompson? Someone else? And then towards the end of the story, bang. Pete tears some of the symbiote away to reveal Harry Osborn. We've now had that mystery stolen from us, and I'm worried it will put us at odds with Peter in the sequel while he tries to figure out who this mysterious Venom character is when we, the player, already know. As for Doc Ock, he's now locked away in the raft, his body crumbling around him, much like with Superior Spider-Man in the comics, and he knows Spider-Man's true identity. I will eat my own hat if we don't get a Superior Spider-Man DLC one day. As brave as it would be for Insomniac to have an entire Spidey game where we're playing as Octavius and Peter's body, I think it's more likely they'll release it as a short, self-contained story for us following the release of Spider-Man 2. Of course, there's Miles Morales and his powers as well, but we already have a sense of what Insomniac are doing there. In the DLC, we get to see Pete beginning to mentor Miles formally, and this should come to fruition in his own story, releasing in a few days. There, we also get the evolution of Yuri into her vigilante alter ego, Wraith. I'd be surprised if we don't get a furthering of her story in Spider-Man Miles Morales, giving us some effective setup for her to play a larger role in Spider-Man 2. And finally, MJ and Pete. By the time Silver Linings comes to a close, they're heading to Sarkovia together, and we know from the Miles Morales trailers that this is where Insomniac have placed Pete, so that Miles gets the opportunity to go through his own trials and tribulations without the safety net of his mentor. There are a lot of great narrative threads here, but with great power comes great responsibility, so it's Insomniac's responsibility not to just snip these threads and forget about them in future games. 
Revisiting Insomniac's take on the webhead through an analytical lens, I can firmly say that I think it's without a shadow of a doubt the best rendition of Spider-Man on a console. And as far as the story goes, I haven't been this emotionally invested in Peter's world since, well... Who am I? I'm Spider-Man. Yeah. There's a lot of room for Insomniac to grow, but like I said before, this is a game which is greater than the sum of its parts. And unfortunately for the dev team, it means my expectations are perhaps a little too great for Miles Morales releasing in a few days. But I know if they can capture the tone and the presentation and the attention to detail like they did with their first game, I'll happily play it and replay it over and over again. Especially if they can fix the stealth. In the meantime, I'll be counting the hours until I can slip into a new Spidey suit and face New York head on. If you need me, you know where I'll be. Okay, I had my hero, I had his power, his name, and then I figured just for fun, I'm going to give him personal problems. This section was written on the 7th of November 2020. This will date the video, but I don't care. There's no thanks for watching section here or request for you to like and subscribe. Considering everything that's happening in the presidential election right now, I, I swayed on even releasing this video, but in the end, fuck it. If you're a voting age in the United States, you've already cast your vote, and you're probably sitting on a knife edge waiting to see what happens next. So, let me say this. I'm Scottish, and a few years ago, the same type of disillusionment mixed with disinformation gave my country our own version of Donald Trump in the form of Brexit. I'm not going to bore you with a full explanation, but the outcome of this election does matter directly to me because, well, unfortunately for my country, the United States of America will be one of our biggest, if not the biggest, trading partners we have after we leave the European Union. Our jobs, our food, our trade, and our economy, never mind our international relations, will be directly impacted by the final outcome of this election. So, we've been watching your election closely, America, closer than we ever have before. And Stephen Colbert said it best. So we all knew he would do this. What I didn't know is that it would hurt so much. If Boris Johnson had even sniffed a statement like what Trump gave the other night, I would be joining those people in the street fully masked up to make sure a monstrous fascist was removed from democratic office. I would be taking the fight to the bad guys with my fists, not with my vote. But I'm not Spider-Man as much as I want to be, and neither are you, so you need to lower your fists and go the smart route, the Peter Parker route. Now, what does this have to do with Spider-Man? Why have I put this in this video? Well, if you're a fan of Donald Trump, you're not a fan of Spider-Man. You're a fan of the Kingpin, of Hammerhead, and of Norman Osborn. If Donald Trump appeared in a Spider-Man story, he would be the bad guy. And the statement he made at midnight UK time, or 6.30pm Washington time on the 5th of November, where he tried to undermine the democratic process of the United States with, like, unsubstantiated claims, calls to arms, and outright lies, is the sort of speech you would see on the final two or three pages of a Spidey comic, with the final panel being a close-up on his bloated cruel face. That's why Norman Osborn is painted as a smarmy, effortlessly controlling fascist over the course of Insomniac's version. You know, when people ask me why I love superheroes so much, why even at the age of 26 I cry at the death of Spider-Man's nan or openly gush about a dumb kid who swings from buildings, it's moments like these in our global history which I will point to. Superheroes give us hope embody a healthy moral code for us to aspire to, and face challenges every single day which, whilst melodramatic, remind us that when we see something wrong, we stand up and speak out. So, uh, Americans who are frightened or enraged right now, first of all, free, feel, feel free to move to Scotland. It's beautiful, we have free healthcare and the patter's pretty great too, but take a deep breath, if it's late where you are, go to sleep, and trust in your historic systems to work, because we are winning. And Trump's scared because he's cornered. Of course that's terrifying, but it's invigorating as well. Because I guarantee that Stan Lee would be reminding us all of that one thing right now that he clung to. The bad guy always loses eventually. Always. Take care.